Okay, so here we go. Here's my quick presentation. So a lot of you have received emails from me. So I want to give you a quick intro to SOP Technologies, what we do. The SOP, that stands for our mission, which is to stop ocean pollution. And as you can imagine, we focus on the technology side of things. I'll give you a quick uh, background about the company in case you haven't heard about us. So we, we really started off with addressing stormwater pollution. So trash on the streets goes into stormwater systems and it falls into waterways. There are some cities in the world where this is not the case, but for the most part, this is what happens, right? And there are many, many tons, millions of tons that, you know, go out into the ocean of trash that people, you know, leave on the streets and it gets washed into the system. Here's a photo of a local storm drain, just so you can get a sense of what goes down there, okay? And, uh, and that's, you know, again, that's our history. That is not related to Sargassum, but I will get to how it is that we started. So in order to solve that problem, we patented a device that prevents trash in the streets from getting into the waterways. And it's, it's worked well. The city of Aventura received an award for implementing it, both for environmental reasons and also cost savings. So that's the beginning, right, of SOP technologies for a mission to stop ocean pollution. Then we decided to expand what we offer. And this is part of the reason why I got involved with this effort today is because we started working with other companies so we can provide other types of solutions that go on waterways. And with Elastec, where's Duane at? Duane is back there, he's with Elastec. We partnered with their company so we can provide things such as barriers for oil containment, debris containment. They also have one for Sargassum, which we will be speaking about, and, uh, and vessels as well to collect trash. And uh, the company Neat Sand, which allows you to uh, you know, remove the, the sargassum from the sand. So these are some of the speakers that we'll have today. But I will go over the, the general speakers list uh, in more detail in just a minute. So leading up to today, see I'm already getting stressed out with this timer here. <laughs> five, five and a half minutes is what I have now. So leading up uh, to today, this effort, all of the folks that are in the room right now, the folks that are joining us on the web, really began only 21 days ago, not that long ago. So uh, Josefina, who is right here, Valentina, and I were at the Biscayne Bay Marine Health Summit Coalition building meeting, which was a local event at FIU. And I was presenting there about, you know, what it is that we do for water pollution things. And that's when the conversation started about the urgency of sargassum issues. And it was literally from July 9th to today that this whole thing happened. So if that doesn't tell you something about the urgency of the issue, I don't know what will. Right, we have people online, we have people here. And why, why do we have so many different people? It's because sargassum is pretty complex. When it comes to stormwater pollution, for example, debris such as plastics getting into the ocean, it's a no brainer. We want to eliminate it. If we could, we would just eliminate the whole thing. Very easy. It's a hard thing to accomplish, but it's a very easy decision to make. Sargassum is not like that. Right? We have uh, impact to beachgoers and businesses, but in terms of ecosystems, it's also a very good thing to have. So it's not a very black and white decision that sargassum is good or bad. Right? So it is complex. And in order to address these issues, we need to have a multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach. So this is a, another uh, quick reminder here. Today's event is being uh, video and audio recorded. We debated whether or not we should do this, hey, Luis, because we know that some people may feel reserved with their comments, but we felt that it was more important to document than, than it was to you know, cater to those needs. So we believe that people will be open and then the conversations will still be free enough, but do keep in mind the event is being video and audio recorded. So today's speakers, we have, again, to follow this multidisciplinary approach, uh, several members of the scientific community, we will also have uh, Joe Gonzalez from Mexico. Now he happens to be a scientist and he works in the industry as well. And it shows that this is an international issue. If it wasn't already clear uh, to those that don't know too much about Sargassum. And uh, we have industry representatives as well to talk about uh, some solutions. Now the audience, how many of you had a chance to fill out the, the survey before coming here? Okay, we, have, we have a few people, okay. So here are the, the data from that survey. 
is it representative of the whole? Probably not. But you can see that we have some academic, government, nonprofit, and industry professionals that are here with us today. So we're already starting to implement this uh, multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach with this event. So it's not that we're saying we, we need to do it at some time in the future. We can do it quickly. So we can collaborate, we can come together, and we're proving it right now in a very short time period. Right? 21 days is what it took to get us all together. You can also see that some of us are, wor are working on research, others are not. There are varying levels of familiarity with sargassum. And some people, uh, you know, they, they categorize themselves as decision makers or, or folks that create policies and others not. Right? So you can see that we have a very diverse group of people here in our audience. So going to the web, somebody asked, can we present ourselves by writing in here? The answer is yes. Good. So for the next thing, I have one and a half minutes now. <laughs> this, is you, this timer is really stressful here. Uh, all right, so very important. Ask questions. If you're online, we want your questions. We want your insights. Feel free to type them into the chat. We have disabled the audio for the webcast just for practical purposes. Um, so if you're in the room, keep in mind that we may need to repeat your question, not because we didn't hear you necessarily, but because we want everybody on the webcast to hear you, okay? So when presenters are up here, if you hear somebody ask a question in the audience, feel free to repeat it so folks on the web know what, what it is that they're asking, okay? So here's a timeline. We'll have a pretty strict timeline, 8.55 to 10.25. The scientific community will have a break for 10 minutes. Then we'll have the industry and international group uh, speaking. We'll have a group discussion, which will be quite lengthy, 50 minutes. And uh, after that will be the closing remarks. Clicking now to the next slide. Since I have 30 seconds, I'll quickly show you what the group discussion will look like. So if you can't have your question answered with a specific speaker, don't worry too much, okay? We will have plenty of time for group discussions. We'll have time for uh, these uh, questions directed at the presenters and then 40 minutes for each sector that is represented here, very loosely defined, you self-define what sector you're in to, uh, to explain what it is that your issues are so the group can provide responses. That's it for me, guys. Thank you. That was my timer. So for the next presenter, Ligia, Professor Ligia Collado Vides. Thank you very much, folks. Ligia, is this, is this your, that's yours? Yes. Okay, so for us on the web right now, we are um, we're switching so, out well, the slides. Hello, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I am Lisa Collado. I work for Florida International University. I'm a marine botanist. And I have been working with uh, algae all my life. Yes, you want to uh, wonderful present. organisms in the world. The most beautiful ones. And of course, they're cleaning the planet. Isn't it? So um, I'm going to start now because he's already there, but it's not here. Now it is. Um, so let me just see here. Okay, so I'm just going to be giving a general introduction because um, I think it's important for all of us to understand what's going on. And. Mm -mm. Nope. Okay, so so first of all, I want. Can you can you pass the slides for me? Sure, sure. Right. We just need to be close to the microphone. So let me oh, the move it this oh, way. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just getting nervous with so many people here. So the first thing is that algal blooms is not a new thing. Everybody is very familiar with algal blooms, and when we think about algal blooms, we think about Gary Grant here, and we think about red tides, and we think about microalgae. But the macroalgal algal blooms, we are talking about organisms that you can see with the naked eye, they're having a different life cycles, and we have them since a long time ago, and nowadays in the world we are having many of them. 
So it's not unique to the Atlantic. This is happening in many different places. It's been happening since the 19s when we had the Kauler Pataxifolia invaded the Mediterranean. So we need to see that this is something that is being accumulating through the years. And uh, so that we need to understand that. Oh my goodness, this is going to take all my time here. Okay. So now about the sargassum, the sargassum is also an international problem. And I don't know if I skip one. Yeah, okay, so this is just to show you what is happening in the Caribbean. Of course, everything started in the 2011 and you can see that there are many different places in 2011, in 2013, in 2015, in 2018, in 2019 nowadays. And these are just the images for you to see in the different islands, in the different places. And I'm pretty sure the people that will talk about oceanography will explain this better than me, but this is very important just for you to understand. What is sargassum? Sargassum is a brown alga. They have nothing to do in terms of evolutionary relationship with plants. They belong to a complete different lineage. But we have the sargassum genus is very diverse. We have more than 350 species. So we are around 350 recognized. And you know that taxonomies, they are creating new names and changing names constantly. So this is something that we don't even know if that the two species that we are talking is two species is one species is one clone so there is a lot of work in that area still <clears throat> the other thing is that the pelagic species that we are having the problem pelagic because they are floating we have other benthic species like corneri that is also creating a lot of problems so sargassum as a genus is growing in different places and Nowadays, you, you go to California and you have the problem that they are displacing the kelps. This is a huge problem. Uh, another dictyota that is from the family of the brown algae in the Strait of Gibraltar is also having a lot of problems there. So this is not unique. And that is something that I really want to tell you. But what is the sargassum sea? There is a huge, huge effort to protect the sargassum sea, to declare a marine protected area because this has a very important ecological role. So if you like, like me, pirates, I love to be a pirate, <clears throat> not present pirates, but in the old times, they were the ones that were like getting lost in the sargassum sea, isn't it? But we know that they have a very important ecological role supporting fisheries. And I'm pretty sure Derek will talk a little bit more about the importance for migratory species between the Atlantic. They are going to be the ones that are going to be providing refuge, providing food, and they are going to be supporting a lot of the fisheries. But why is that we are having the problem now? Uh, since 2011, this is a picture from Sierra Leone in Africa. We are starting to receive a bunch of massive influx of sargassum, but it's not always the same. It's not always the same places. There are going to be places that are going to be very affected. And also the oceanographers will talk about this. It's just to tell you that there is a forecasting about how, uh, where the sargassum is coming. And now they are focusing very much within the Brazilian issue, isn't it? That I'm going to be talking a little bit. So you have the big picture in one minute, in another minute now is the working hypothesis. Everybody's asking why, what is happening? And I just really, really want to make emphasis, working hypothesis. We still don't have the shutting gun. We haven't done the whole experiment to completely conclude things. Where it's coming, there are challenges for oceanography. Are the, the currents are changing. Do we have now two patches, and that is already known, that we have a patch in the Sargassum Sea, another one in the, no in the south, the great big belt of Sargassum, and that there is a connectivity between the two type of oceans now. And there are going to be currents. We also have been receiving, Victoria, we cannot forget that we have been receiving sargassum from the north area. And that is a problem in taxonomy, a problem to identify the species, and of course, a, a problem to uh, oceanographers. Are we really receiving from Brazil here or not? So those are still questions that we have to solve. What are the causes? Nutrients. We are blaming Brazil now. You see all the videos. You see Brian Lapointe. Brazil is killing everything. How many years do we have? I don't want to say Monsanto, but I already say it. The, what bringing all those nutrients into the oceans? Yes, nobody. I'm not saying Brazil is doing all of these, but there is many years of accumulation of these nutrients in the ocean. So we have a lot of challenges. And when we're thinking about the nitrogen footprint, but we need to think also about the carbon footprint. So there are many places where we are really dumping nutrients in the ocean. The increase in temperature is not only to Brazil, it's, only, it's also to many other places. What are the possible sources? 
really is the whole thing in the whole Atlantic coming just from the big, uh, big belt when we have years of years of knowing the North Sargassum Sea as well. So there are going to be also studies that we need to do in terms of the potential impacts. How, what are the impacts? Are there vectors for introduced species? What is going to be happening in the beaches? Uh, they are bringing heavy metals. The bacterials are coming and changing the accumulation of organic matter. So the amount of questions that we have are just huge, isn't it? So uh, this is the scenario that we have now and we have more questions than solutions. And that's where we need to start really thinking that we're talking about multisectorial, multidisciplinary, and we are really talking about multi-scales, time and space, isn't it? So I want to very quickly talk about the big picture. So we know that the planetary boundaries are the place where, the space, where our planet can still work, and the footprint of nitrogen, the footprint of uh, phosphorus is really beyond the planetary boundaries. And this is not only coming from the Great Belt. As I was showing you in the very beginning, these problems are happening all around the place. And of course, for those that are still seeing that we don't have global warming, and not only temperature, guys, we're increasing the carbon in the oceans as well. The marine organisms have always been limited by carbon. So we are increasing the carbon, but we need to show how the combination of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and temperature is increasing. So what we really need to address, and for all of the sectors, we really need to think, this is here to stay. I, and I don't say sargassum is going to stay all the time. We don't know. We had a Daniel Mene here, and after 10 years, now we have the Aegini or something else. We don't know how long sargassum is going to be here, isn't it? But what we know is that we are not going, we are going to be full of surprises in terms of nature is already responding, we are already in a different moment of our planet. So rapid tipping points might be not reversible and we need to really be thinking in this way nowadays, isn't it? So when we are putting dots together, it's not only sargassum, it's going to be many other type of um, algal blooms and that's what I'm telling you, we are in the psychological era, micro, macro, red, brown, greens, all of the different algae are blooming all around the place. And this is not only from the seven, uh, 11. If you think, uh, 2011, if you realize in this case for the dinoflagellates that are going to be causing all of these famous paralytic surface motion, and this is just an example, all of them are increasing. You can see they're increasing all around the world. So this is the very big picture that I want to bring here. And, uh, sorry, now moving to the in local impacts. In the local impacts, you have six minutes. In the local impacts, this is just a study that we did in Puerto Morelos, Mexico. And we were trying to do another study. We were trying to do how much the, the algae were calcifying and we couldn't do it because all of the sargassum came and created this cloud. So there is no photosynthesis down there. Our experiment was destroyed. So, but what we were able to see is at least, this is a very short snapshot. There is the paper, you can read the whole thing. Sargassum arrives, stays there, is going to completely wipe out the seagrasses. Why? Because you have anoxia. You create a completely anoxic on the ground and it's killing the seagrasses from the merry stems. When you have Dilma, that it was, I, I don't know if you remember the hurricane, completely took away many of the seagrasses, but the, still the merry stems and the roots were alive. Here is killing by anoxia everything. And then the amount of nutrients that we measure in the algae that were deposited is like creating a whole eutrophication problem in a short time. So you're having, after having the sargassum, a instability in the beaches, you are going to be losing the sand, and at least you say, well, you have some time for resilience, but the next year comes again, and the next year comes again. So this is just a snapshot of many of the problems in the impact, bacterial activities, heavy metals, there are many other activities. So this is a little bit of what we are doing. So th that is what, just to show you the impact if you allow all of that sarcasm to stay over there. So my student, Lowell Iporak, he is doing a fantastic job. And we are really timing, uh, teaming with uh, Dr. Uh, Calder here and many other citizens. Please download the EpiCollect 5, we need your help. This is bringing the citizens into helping us to ground uh, truth in where the sargassum is arriving. This is just an example of all the different sites that citizens have been sending us information. 
you can see that there is ups and downs, ups and downs, and we are keep going with all this data. It's very important for us to understand where the sarcasm, how much, how frequent, what is the periodicity. Uh, so this is some of the things that are, we are doing in my lab, and also uh, we're measuring already nutrients, and we are looking that they are not overwhelming. On, on the contrary, they are limited. So they are below the 1.8 for nitrogen, and they are really very low in phosphorus. All of the brown algae are low in phosphorus how we are going to be interpreting the nutrient values that we are going to start getting, they are using everything to grow, period. So the, that is going to be very important to, to keep going. Some lessons from the Caribbean, because I have four minutes. So that was just to tell you, we are doing things, we need your help. There is a lot of things to do in terms of the impact. What have we learned from the Caribbean? The islands have been dealing with this since 2011. So the first thing, everybody was surprised. We don't have a task force for sarcasm. Who is going to be dealing? What is the agency that needs to deal with this? Is the fisheries, is the government, is the people at the end, the, the, the citizens have to jump into that, isn't it? So many solutions are now trying to be developed. They are really trying to have, this, uh, this is something that is used in different places where you don't have any kind of barriers, but you have the actual boats going and, and bringing all of the sargassum out. You are going to have also the barriers and in some places are working, in some places are not working. There is a lot of experimental work about the fauna and the impact on the fauna. And if that is going to be working, that will be needing a boat that is going to be cleaning every single day. I was in Punta Cana, you can see that if they don't clean immediately, there is a huge, massive die off and impacting the corals already. So the impact on the, on the corals, because what you're doing is moving the accumulation to another place. So something that is, I can, you know, Emilio has this and you can have all this uh, PowerPoint whenever you want. And then something that is absolutely mandatory, we need to educate people. We cannot leave everybody in the blank. They are going to be listening to whatever. And we really need to provide educational flyers. There is a lot of work already done in the Caribbean, creating posters, creating uh, different type of flyers, information to the general public. Is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? So there is an explosion of um, opportunities. I have two minutes and I just want to end up saying that this is something, these are just ideas for us to work, how we're going to be organizing ourselves. We need a management education collection disposal. Who is going to collect, where is that going to go? Scientific, we need to understand what is happening. And forecasting and monitoring. We really need to know what is coming. And we need to understand how the people are understanding about that, how we are impacting our society with our strategy, how we are impacting everything. And then this is going to be very important. We need to collect, we need to remove, we need to store, and we need to use in a very intelligent way. So we already learned from the Caribbean everything that we shouldn't be doing. So we need to have the research in terms of the impacts. What is going to be the impact, the economic, the health issue? We need to train people on what is going to be the best practices. What are going to be the best practices for storage, for disposal, for use? Are we going to be providing the permits? So the government need to be jumping in and saying the permits for disposal, where you are going to be sending this, where you are going to be bringing, can, can you sell it? Can you not sell it? Are they going to charge you for using it in different kind of sources? That is a very important legal aspect. And how at the end I can remember the private sector needs to jump with all the public se sector. So uh, I just want to, to uh, and all of these need to be linked, isn't it? And what we are talking about, the multidisciplinary, multisexual, sexual, sex, well, you understood the word. Uh, and then this is going to be a different time scales and different spatial scales. So this is not a simple thing. We need really, really, really to work together and thinking that this problem is here. So we are being challenged to the new era and the new era needs intelligent collaborations, working together because this is not the only problem. Okay, and that is my invitation that we create collaborations. We need to think and we need to devote time like a PhD student need to think about the question. We need to think about how we are going to be organizing our different grouping sectors, isn't it? And uh, we only have one planet, guys, and this is it. This is time to work together and Please help us with Epi Collect, and there are some other sources you can do with it. Thank you. All right, so we have. Uh, thank you, Emilia. 
Michelle and myself. Please set the timer for three minutes for some Q&A. We're trying to catch up on time here. Here's a so question we have from the me. web already. You're telling me my time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, uh, Teresha asked. How can go local government get involved to provide data for research? Pam, can you answer that? <laughs> I, I, I am not, I don't work in the government, but I have been working and it's fantastic when you have a team when you can work together with the government. I have been working with uh, the Biscayne Aquatic Reserve and the DERM and teaming with people, providing our questions and helping each other with the monitoring, for example. It's been an open source. So I think, yes, we can do it. And, but the government is not the only one doing this. For example, all of the monitoring programs that we run through the universities are in collaboration with the government. So it, it, it's working together, yes. Any uh, questions from the folks in the room for uh, Professor Puyalovides? That was really awesome. Yes, Valentina? So the question is, uh, does, has the Mexican government allocated funds for research? I know they have allocated money. I don't know how they are distributing it. Uh, I I don't know that information, Valentina. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I'd like to ask: Is there any uh, has, has there been any changes in natural occurrence of Gatham Sea? These other these other areas of the Gatham Sea just have sprung up out of nowhere, but the Gatham Sea is a natural. So they're not, they, they, they're, they're at least in 1939, and then it was another one in 1980 something. Uh, a big evaluations of the, the amounts, and there is a fluctuation. So these, the biomass, remember, they are living things, and they have fluctuated and going down and going up. I think we need to have a concentration also to understand what is happening in the north. So uh, there is an increase in generally in macroalgal blooms, yes, in terms of particularly the north, see we need like another monitoring. And maybe the oceanographers will be able to answer that. We have another question from the room. Uh, Luis Rodriguez, let's take yours quickly, and then there's a gentleman out back. Uh, what has been the most uh, common, sorry, <clears throat> what has been the most common use of water gas in this collaborative Well, that is one of the biggest problems in the Caribbean. They have been working on this. So one of the biggest problems is disposal, and they're disposing in different ways, whatever they can, and in some places they are contaminating the, the underground water. But compost is being one, uh, building houses. And I think that is the best one because you are storing it. So you are sequestering the carbon, you are sequestering everything. So there is, and there are now tests for biofuels. They, are, they have also uh, for plates and straws and cups. So the creativity is just huge. There, there are sneakers, we are doing sneakers as well. So let's, let's take the gentleman's question. Yes, sir, uh, did you have a question? Or? Oh, even better, we're on time. All right, good. All right. Thank, Th you. thank you. Thank you, Professor. Give her a hand of applause. Okay, so now we're switching to the next presentation. Okay, so folks on their web, I know that you asked a few more questions. The good thing is that we are logging everything. So um, whether you want to or not, we will get to that question later. Okay, so let's see. Marcel, let's, you have the timer ready? Let's make that uh, 12 minutes. Okay, so. Do you want to use the, the arrows over here? This one? This one okay, right yeah. here? Okay. Okay. Perfect. So this Thank way. you. Yep. Okay. Uh, hello, it's Malmé from School of Sao Gomi. Do you want here? Do you want to uh, uh, I'm going, sorry? So do we should click here, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's also, the yeah. microphone or yeah. this is the microphone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I work at the Atlantic Oceanographic Lab across the street here from Erasmus at the Physical Oceanography Division. I'm the director of that division. 
and I'm joined here by my colleague Rick Lampkin, uh, he's the deputy of that division. Uh, we have been working on sargassum. We are physical oceanographers, uh, the group uh, in our division. And, uh, so we monitor ocean circulation and we monitor particles, have particles of different shapes and buoyancy uh, uh, translate and move in the ocean. And I wanted to present to you, my part is going to be only two slides. Uh, one is uh, a product that has been shown in the previous presentation by our colleague, Chuan Min Hu from University of South Florida and his team in work funded by his university and NASA. And how we are using this product to create, uh, we started doing this uh, a few weeks ago, publishing it a, week, a few weeks ago, uh, maps of sargassum inundation risk in the Caribbean Sea Gulf of Mexico and Florida. And uh, so uh, this is the map that you saw before. Uh, this is created by John Min Hu. These are satellite based estimates of uh, a, an index, a sargassum sargassum index that uh, uses uh, the, uh, the floating algae index that he details in his webpage and also color uh, to determine shapes and circulation in the ocean. Uh, this is a very novel and unique work that has been used to monitor since uh, 2016 the different concentrations and path of sargassum in the Caribbean Sea and in the tropical Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico and gives you an idea of how this has been, the patterns of distribution have changed, uh, the uh, location of where this uh, sargassum uh, is actually reaching to. And uh, we wanted at NOAA to have, uh, to create a, a map, a product with this fields that actually can provide information to decision makers and people in coastal areas. So this is where we go to the next figure. Uh, I brought here, um, if you want to pass it around, only a few copies of what we distribute weekly sargassum inundation risk uh, fields that use the fields that uh, John Min could create. And uh, in case with the color scale, we use three color scales of uh, how much uh, sargassum is uh, close to 50 kilometers from the coastal area. Uh, we, uh, uh, this is really new. What we need here is actually observers to help us in each location. And we already have in several areas that can tell us Yes, your maps of sargassum inundation in coastal areas are right, are wrong, or they sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. And uh, we have those in the Virgin mm -hmm. Islands, in Puerto Rico, uh, in the West, uh, in the Tampa area, and uh, we would like to get more volunteers for this. I mean, I, okay, Vijay has just presented something that could be used. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. And uh, mm -hmm. so. Uh, I, our inf contact information is there. We would like to, these products, we've been working for more than two years to create this product, but they have been posted publicly uh, since three weeks ago. And we would like to have your input. And uh, something very important. Uh, this is the last thing I say. And um, if you have sargassum 50 kilometers from the coast, it doesn't mean that it's going to get to the coast. So for that, Josefina is going to show some experiments that we have started doing uh, at uh, NOAA and the University of Miami here to assess the impact of the wind and the ocean currents pushing the sargassum into the coast, along the coast or off the coast. And uh, that is very important if we want to do in the future good prediction using this estimate. And that's what Thank I have you. to say. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so uh, once we have the the values of sargassum 50 kilometers.
from the course. The idea is how we can do to get uh, what the impact will be in the different part of the course, right? So for that, we need to understand currents and wind or floating things um, and locally, right? So currents, uh, uh, we need to know the currents uh, locally. That's, that's very important, right? So I want to emphasize here because people usually don't know this, that this is different than drinking water. So it's not just using usual models for circulation, right? So we have floating things that has impact because of the wind. So for understanding that, we organized some experiments as um, Gustavo mentioned, but also we start working with theory to incorporate on the models, usual circulation models, how uh, the buoyancy effect, so the fact that the, the object or the sargassum is interacting also with the water and the atmosphere, how we can include that in our model. So that is what we are doing uh, experiments and theory to incorporate that on pre and the ultimate goal is to to predict how the sargassum mats are, are moving. Um, what? It's not moving. Right. Okay, so here we have some of the experiments we did. I will be talking just about the one, the, the green one, which is uh, just uh, offshore Miami. So we um, we did uh, we did I mean uh, uh, four experiments in the North Atlantic and one here in the Gulf Stream. Uh, what we basically did we deploy uh, different shapes, uh, uh, different drifters. With uh, so we were tracking them by GPS and uh, we have a spheres, cubes, and we also have some kind of sargassum mat and we follow. Um, uh, these um, drifters uh, for a while. I am showing just the first week. I want to point out here the figure you, you have, the first figure you have, the drifter were deployed all together and you have the time. So after a week, where they are. And you can see they were very similar in, in size, but they have some differences in shape and flotability and buoyancy. And you can see after a, a wind event that we have after the second day, how different all of them behave, right? So just to tell you a little of the difference, the main difference was not the size, the main difference was that the cube was a little more exposed to wind and, and so on, and the less exposed to the wind was the sargassum. So you can see there that if we need to consider the wind or the interaction with the atmosphere, what factor we need to, to include, and that is what we are working with the theory. So these are just uh, some preliminary results on how we can model this, and you can see the real drifter in, in complete line, the break line is our mean uh, prediction with the model, taking into account the different buoyancy. So uh, we are very happy with the results. And we have some shade area uh, showing the errors. So this is a first attempt to, to include buoyancy uh, in the movement of, of, of buoyancy in the ocean. Okay, even if we have the perfect model, the first thing we need is the perfect velocity, which is actually very complicated. But anyway, we, we, we for the coastal region, uh, in the case uh, around South Florida, Miami, we, we are lucky that we have many uh, high frequency radars. So you can see the cover of the radars and that will give you a, a velocity. So for that case, we may not need a, an actual model for that part because we have velocity observation, so we have a good cover of that. But it will not be the case always, and we, and for different tests or understanding more, we usually, probably we will need a model. I just have an example using one model uh, of, an, of a map that started like 10 kilometers from Key Biscayne, and I consider just three different winds, just as an example, and you can see that in the case of the first, after a day, that is the little dot, um, we have the arrival to Key Biscayne. In the second case, we have the arrival in Miami Beach, a little more, almost two days after. And in the third case, we have no arrival to the coast, right? Just is a very simple example, but showing what kind of information we can have, knowing the satellite information offshore and how we can traduce that to put it inshore with, once we have a reliable uh, Current. So this is what we can do from the physical oceanographer point of view. 
we can uh, have observation from satellite offshore, and we can bring that uh, inshore using uh, coastal currents uh, from model or from observations. But more importantly, is taking into account how the mats behave different than water. So we need to take into account the buoyancy, and for that, we will keep doing some experiments, and we can we are still working on improving the uh, the theory. But that's the plan, and this is what we can we can do for this uh, group. And and I just want to finish that. Thank you. And just saying that I mean I just I'm just here, but uh, in Rasma we have facilities and equipment and expertise uh, to deal with this kind of things we are uh, presenting from the physical point of view. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Marcel, let's, uh, let's set up the Q&A timer for five minutes. So we have a question already from somebody online. They asked, uh, this is from Scott Stripling, what oceanic circulation model is being used at what horizontal resolution? Uh, I mean, this is just as an example, for, and actually it's not a, uh, with very high resolution, it's, uh, I think it's a little less than a kilometer. And I was just using just some run that I already have from my previous experiment. It's, I, I'm not, I do not have right now um, a coastal model working uh, for this particular problem. So it's something that we need to set up, yeah. So the resolution is maybe five, 500 meters or something, yeah. Great, great. Any questions from the room? Yeah, so we, we, we didn't yet, but uh, we, we put things of different size, but we're not all sargassum, but we are planning new experiments. But yeah, the, the size also is, a, is will have some influence, but the main influence that from the preliminary results are the buoyancy, is the buoyancy. Okay, so yeah. any other, yes, and just so you know, we'll repeat your question for the folks on the web. So. Okay, maybe with the But you mean by to study the transport sargassum? If I am well, including it's, the dust, it's a little bit longer. I mean, I, I see that you are looking at how it travels. And yeah. How it goes so I didn't, I didn't include the change in density of the sargassum. So yeah. So I have to repeat the question. Sorry. So the question was if I was including the the change of concentration of sargassum in the model, and it's not. I am just. Uh, a first test with constant uh, concentration of sargassum, just one example. Uh, one complicated issue of sargassum when you put that in the model is that the buoyancy constantly change. This is why we are uh, doing these experiments with different types of sargassum and buoyancies. And the objective is to start uh, from a John Means map, maps and start uh, assessing different scenarios with different type of buoyancies and, uh, and then make assessments to see which one actually are being uh, correct. With time, they will sink and you will not see them in the maps, but uh, uh, when they are at the surface, uh, the wind plays different effects on the sargassum. Are we using the sargassum? Is this productive? What is loaded or what is down? Do you know that? Is this repeat the question, by the way? If, if we are what? what? The people that are using the sargassum for something. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we will save that question for the, for the discussion. So the, the question was about the use of sargassum for other purposes after it is uh, collected, I presume. So here's another question from the web. Is the radar helping to identify the sargassum mats? A follow up on that one. Are there collaborations with Mexico in these models? Please give information. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, the radar, we haven't used it yet. On, I mean, I, I, but it's something that I was starting to work uh, with Nick Shape, who is the one in charge here for the radars. 
And the model, yes, the model development were part of a big project in Mexico. It was most, mostly related with the oil transport. The, the project is Sibom. Uh, so part of the, the, the results are part uh, of what we did with the oil experiments, yeah. Uh, uh, with Mexico and other Caribbean countries, uh, the international collaboration is led by IOC Caribe, that is uh, led by, um, help me here, uh, in Colombia, and uh, it, Yes, and uh, so they, they are the ones that are trying to put all the international groups together. Uh, Cesar Toro in Colombia is the leader of IOC Caribbean, and he is trying to put the governments and agencies of the different countries affected, both for sargassum and oil, to create groups of studies and monitoring and create assessments. Yeah. Great. So uh, we have uh, one extra minute, actually, fortunately. So we'll, we'll take one of the questions that was okay. online. They asked, um, this is from uh, Sherman's. Do you have plans to model the variability of sargassum depending on age and incrustations? Well, I mean, I, I think it would be difficult. As I, I mean, it's very close to the previous questions about the concentration, right? So the density is one of the variables in the model, but for the moment we have it uh, constant, but I guess we could include it, but uh, I have no answer of, yeah, age is related to buoyancy. Yeah, probably. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, but but the buoyancy that we are at the point at this point is constant per each run. But we, yeah, I guess we could incorporate that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will set up the slides for Valentina. So I just wanted to remind everyone that later on we will have a lot more time for questions and answers. I know we're a bit rushed. There are a lot of us here. We have lots of questions. So I just wanted to, uh, to remind you so you don't feel left out. I need to change the display settings here. We got slide four. Okay, for the folks on the on the webcast, are you seeing the full screen? You can just type in the chat there. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, Marcel, let's start the, let's make it 14 minutes. Let's start it now. Thank you. Okay, Valentina. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as an organizer uh, team of this meeting, I'm very pleased to have all of you here. As uh, Ligia said, the problem with algae are around the world. So our ocean is giving the symptoms that the ocean is sick. And we are here because we want to help uh, try to cure our ocean. So I'm very happy you're here. And uh, hopefully in the discussions, we can work with all the solutions that we're going to give and share our knowledge and to be unified to try to uh, address this problem in the proper way. So I'm going to, par I'm going to talk about the ge uh, geochemical part. So there is essential information that we need in order to develop a comprehensive management plan to deal with the sargassum in Florida beaches. There are also another information that we need in order to understand uh, the causes of the, of the problem, and that has to be done by oceanographic cruises. So we are a group of scientists, uh, multidisciplinary, with a lot of experience from different institutions. Ross Steele School of Atmospheric Science, we have uh, Peter Swart and Amanda uh, Ehlert, and we have collaborators from uh, Nova Southeastern University, and from NOAA, we have here uh, uh, or uh, three friends that I will mention later. OK, 
Okay, in the Caribbean, the Caribbean governments are spending a lot of money just cleaning the beaches. So they haven't really uh, spent money in research and the research is needed in order to understand the problem and to give important information about what is happening uh, with this uh, problem and how to deal with the problem locally. So for example, Mexico has spent $45 million, French territory $12 million. We heard that in Miami, maybe they will spend between 40 to, uh, to $50 million just for cleaning the beaches. And so as a, as, a, as a people that we are interested in collaborating and we know that can give answers as a people that has been studying processes in, in the ocean. So we want to collaborate with everybody, you know, with the government and the industry to try to help this problem. For that reason, we need uh, interdisciplinary science that can give us information from different perspectives. That's why we created this group from the perspective point of marine biology, marine chemistry, marine geology, and marine physics. And of course, to deal with the problem locally, we need people from different sectors in order to know what are you dealing with. Uh, yes, okay. How can I go back here? There? No, back, 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 back. back, back. No, no, no. Well, I'm going forward? We're going, yeah, right at the beginning. Which one? Okay, so. It's like uh, the second one. Slide number two? Slide number two. Yeah. Three? No, three, three. Three? Okay. What can I do here or here? I'm going to go down. down. You just make sure that, make sure the arrows. But this is, no, wait, wait, put the full screen. Screen, no. All right, maybe maybe you can continue uh, presenting. Let's just hold on. Right, it's there. It's on the screen, so okay. we'll just give it time here for the computer to react. That's the right slide. Yeah, that's the right slide. Okay, so I'll change the display settings for the people on the web. If yeah. So anyway, in uh, Florida, we are receiving more sargassum every year. So we really need to start thinking, how are we going to deal with this sargassum? And uh, we have to allocate funds for dealing with this sargassum in a proper way. For that reason, we need science, interdisciplinary science. Um, right now is the perfect time to start a preventing phase. And for that, we need scientific information. So should I do this? Or going down? No, it's okay, it's okay. Here. It's good. Okay. Right. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so our study is a geochemical study and we want to characterize the chemical composition of the sargassum tissue. Because in the governments in, around the Caribbean, they need this information. They don't have this information. And for example, for removal, for disposal, and for uses, they need they, to know what is it in the sargassum. If they contain toxic metals, so we have the capability to measure all the different elements in the periodic table. So we will focus on metals of uh, trace metals that are uh, at toxic levels, can be of concern for public health and can be of concern for the environment. So we also are going to measure uh, major elements that are important for some of the uses, especially for example, for fertilizers and to know if the, if the, um, the algaes also promote the growing, for example, nitrogen and phosphorus are important because those are nutrients that the algae will take and they will use it for, for, uh, for reproducing and for surviving and uh, to be alive. So potassium also is important in terms of fertilizer. We're going to measure rare earth elements and isotopes that are going to give us information about the uh, origin of, uh, certain elements, uh, of certain elements and where is the, the sargasso coming from. Because we really don't know if really it makes uh, directly if there are sargassum that is uh, born in the um, equatorial area is really arriving here. So sargassum and all the macroalgae absorb elements along their, their way that they're traveling. And then we can use the geochemical trace, uh, uh, different elements as a geochemical traces. So now we are collecting sargassum from different beaches in Florida. And we are planning to collect sargassum around 
different parts of the Caribbean. Yeah, that's the right one. So we know that the composition is going to be variable because it's going to be changing depending on the water that sargassum is, is in it. So for example, the sargassum close to the marinas, they are going to absorb different metals from gasoline and oil and some organic compounds. Together with the sargassum raft, there are traveling tons of plastic. And now we are partnered with some uh, expedition that is going to be around the world doing some research about plastic. So we are going to investigate also what is the plastic in the sargassum. Okay. So we are going to use a uh, ship of opportunity and personal contacts in order to collect samples from around the Caribbean in order to see if there is any fingerprint and if in order to compare spatial distributions. So we're going to be measuring isotopes composition, different isotopes, uh, in order that can tell us for example, if the nitrogen source of the sargassum is coming from fertilizers, river runoff, from nitrogen fixation, from Sahara dust, or where does it come from? Also, we know that in the, um, in the Amazon, Amazon uh, watershed, in Peru and Brazil and uh, Ecuador, they are, they are gold minings. So the gold mining so have a lot of mercury, and it's important to assess if we are receiving the sargassum with mercury or not because we don't know maybe the sargassum from uh, the amazon river doesn't arrive to miami but we will see so we have the best uh, laboratory equi equipment that any uh, any chemist can really dream so we have a clean trace metal laboratory so that in general uh, is difficult to get in order to get to obtain a precise ultra low analysis for different concent for low concentrations of different elements. So we can measure, as I told you, mostly the entire periodic table, trace metals, rare earths, and different isotopes. We have uh, the best instruments and the most modern instruments that unfortunately not in many places can have. Actually, it's very difficult to have. And then we have also uh, a great equipment for isotope analysis that has been working for so many years. And uh, our team, of course, is experienced. We have, 30, uh, Peter has 35 years working on the isotopes. I have been 20 years working for trace metals and Amanda 10 years working with isotopes, trace metals, rare earths and different things. And we have a wonderful collaborators also that are going to help us with different, uh, in different expertise with different areas. So we're also planning to do in the second phase a mesocosm experiment that is control experiment in order to know that if the, what is the cycle of sargassum? Because as Ligia said, so we really don't know what is the cycle of sargassum. We don't know if the sargassum produced near to the Amazon River arriving to Florida. So by control, by uh, these uh, experiments that are controlled, we can try to get some information about that. So we can do also nutrient enrichment and uptake for metals and isotope composition. So this is going to be done at Nova Southeastern University with Dr. Uh, Riegel and students that are going to help us for that. Water quality, so actually when I was, uh, when we were sampling sargassum, we also saw that there is a dec decomposition and it's creating a huge problem in Miami Beach for water quality. And later it's going to create a very big problem also for the, the quality of the sand because everything is going to go to the sand. So then we made a partnership with one of the most incredible laboratories for nutrients. And we have here people that has been dedicating more than 40 years measuring nutrients all around the world. And we have here uh, George Barbarian, uh, Charlie and Dr. Sang from NOAA. They have, we have been actually together and we met together doing measurements across the ocean. So we already passed in 2014. So we sampled the middle of the Atlantic Ocean from north to south. So they have the equipment, we have the capabilities, and we really are concerned about what are the problems of water quality with the people, with the tourists. The other day, the last week, I went to, my, uh, to, to Miami Beach, and I saw a lot of people swimming in this uh, uh, brown water. 
So the government needs to know what is happening in order to protect the environment and people. As, we, as uh, Ligia said, there are a lot of commercial uses. So our information is going to help us to understand what commercial uses we can give and how are we going to do, how are we going to plan the remediation activities? So is the sargassum toxic or not? So the sargassum can be served for fertilizers that are here downstairs, liquid fertilizers in Mexico. And over there, there is a guy, 82 years old guy that is starting in Barbados doing fertilizer, just grounding it, drying it and grounding it. So if people in Mexico has done these uh, shoes, and of course we can give different activities, uh, different uh, commercial uses. As a, yeah, as a summary, so we will use the geochemical information as a finger, uh, fingerprint method. So we will use trace metals, isotope, in order to know more about the origin of the sargassum. Uh, we need to know if the blooms are caused by ex intrinsic or extrinsic factors, or there is problems with runoff, there is problem with atmospheric input from the Sahara, are they uh, local blooms or regional blooms? We have to, with this, uh, the chemical composition, uh, we need, we can infer all this information. So are the, the sargassum risk to human health? Because in Mexico, there are a lot of people cleaning the beaches and they have the sargassum until they're the waste, you know? So we need to know, and we need to protect these people, not only, you know, for the, um, that, that can be absorbed by the skin, but also because with it decomposed, there is a, sulf a sulfidric acid, so that is important. So we want to help. We're very happy that, that we are here all together. And I think we are uh, really exciting to try to find solutions and working towards the same goal together. Thank you very much. Uh, some questions. Marcel, can you set the timer there for five minutes for the Q&A and you can start it now? So, so did, I, did I make my time? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I was like, yeah. you okay, good. Yes, actually. For the people in, uh, in our uh, remote areas, actually welcome. So we're very happy because we know you are from the Caribbean, from Mexico, from different parts. So we're very happy that you are here. Um, uh, so, uh, Gustavo Goni is asking, how are we going to use the, the ships of opportunity? And actually this is like asking favors. I am a Mexican and we are used to ask favors. You know, we knock the door, next door and say, okay, can we have uh, sugar and then we get sugar so it's the same so for me as a Mexican I said okay so we are going to ask and we will you will be the first one actually Gustavo we know that you are doing research cruises so we want that uh, since the, the, the time ship is very expensive so we want to use people that are around you know like private yachts uh, ships for, from Rasma sh ships from NOAA that can collect some samples for us in order to compare what are the different concentrations between the, the sargassum that is stranded on the beaches and what is the concentration floating around the ocean? For research effort or is the research effort you mean? Yeah. Okay. So the question is that the, if there is any research, uh, research effort in order to uh, to understand if this uh, the, you know if the sargassum is is uh, having an environmental impact in, with organisms. Uh, actually, I was reading you know I was trying to find all the different liter literature in order to find papers about trace metals. We only found two, one from Cuba and one from uh, from Africa, and they were only you know, one-time measurements. So we're planning actually to do it uh, uh, stationally at least four or five times per year. And unfortunately, <coughs> when, when I read, you know, the methodology, they dry the sample in the oven, so it's contaminated already the sample. And we know, you know, like as a person that has been working with trace metal research for 20 years in different parts of the world, I know that it's extremely important to have clean labs and the technology. 
So because the technology, you know, like we can measure trace metals by ICPMS, by um, uh, atomic absorption, but the ICPMS is the, the best, the, 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 the highest, the, gives you the highest precision. So it's really important to know, to have the capability, uh, not just the mental capability because the facility. Great, let's, uh, maybe we should take a couple of questions from the web, there are plenty of them, and then we'll oh, go back sorry. into the room. So one question from the web, from Joe, where are they disposing the sargasso in Florida once they pick it up from the beach? A second question from somebody else, uh, do we already know the gas contained inside the floating vesicles? Is it only oxygen? No, actually it's not, uh, it's not oxygen, it's CO2. And then when it decomposes, it's, uh, it's converting to uh, sulfidric acid. Uh, actually, the sargassum is, is a really good uh, macroalgae and it's something that we need. The ocean needs sargassum because in the ocean right now, there is a very high concentration of CO2. So in order that the, um, the uh, you know, in order to, to get rid of this CO2, in my personal opinion, not as a scientist, if not as a human, is that the ocean is trying to take this CO2, producing all these algae blooms, and also because it's a lot of, uh, you know, we have, in a, we have a, a high temperatures. So with sargassum, so temperatures can go in the area that sargassum is maybe a little low because those does not allow to go, you know, the light going inside of the ocean. So I think that, um, that the ocean is trying to cure themselves uh, itself for all the things that we are doing that we are really not aware. And that this is the time that we have to wake up. Uh, what was the first one? The first one was, where are they disposing of oh. the sargassum in Florida once they pick it up from the beach? Actually, I don't know. I saw that in Key Biscayne, they are boring the sargassum and they really don't know the chemical composition. So they really don't know if they are really harming the environment by boring the, that. In Mexico, for example, it's really, the situation is really bad. I feel very sad about that, about the way that they dispose. Like in Mexico, they, they, they uh, bring all the sargassum that, uh, uh, on the uh, rainforest. So they are going to be impacting the rainforest ecosystem just for bringing tons of sargassum there. So. Okay. Thank you, Valentina. You're welcome. Thank you. So there is going to be more time for questions and for solutions after the talks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for the folks on the web, we are switching now the presentation so we can open up the presentation by Elena and her team. So for the folks on the web, I know there were several questions for Valentina and there will be many more. Uh, once again, just please note that we will continue the conversation after the speakers in a group discussion and we are keeping records of all the questions so we can get back to you later on. Thanks. Fifteen minutes or so, thank you. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm here to talk about I'm here to talk about a um, aspect that is related to sargasm that we think is related, and it's enterococci, which is a bacteria uh, that is used to issue beach advisories. Um, I'm Helena Solo Gabriel, I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering um, at the University of Miami. And the individuals who do the day to day work on this project are two graduate students, Afifa Abdul Ghani who um, is currently out of Miami, but she prepared the first draft of this presentation. And Peter Sawell, who will be joining me in this presentation. So the first question is, what is enterococci? Well, um, enterococci in the top figure, um, you see the red splotches. Um, they're sort of circular in shape. This is what they look like under a microscope. And because they're circular, they're coxi and entero means that they come from the gastrointestinal tract. 
And so enteropoxi typically are bacteria that live in our gastrointestinal tract. They don't necessarily cause disease, um, but they are an indicator of potential disease-causing organisms. So if you see a lot of enterococci in the environment, the assumption is that perhaps that area has been impacted by sewage. Um, I wanted to emphasize also how we analyze enterococci. And on the bottom slide, we see these blue splotches here. And the way we analyze them is we take a sample of water, we put it through a filter, and the bacteria gets stuck on the filter. And then we put that filter on nutrient that is specific to the bacteria. Overnight, that one bacteria multiplies to a million, which we can see as a colony. And because of the nutrients in the agar, it turns blue. So every blue splotch there represents an original bacteria and pteropoxide bacteria. So the question is, um, how are these related to human health? Um, the Florida Department of Health does measure enterococci on a weekly basis at all beaches um, in Miami and actually in the state of Florida. And the magic number for enterococci is 71 organisms. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, every one of those dots, blue dots, was a colony forming unit. So the units that we use to enumerate enterococci is CFU, colony forming units, and for water, it's on a per 100 milliliter basis. And again, the number that we utilize to close beaches is 71. So the, event, the objectives of our study um, are illustrated here. It's a three-phase study. And um, it's focused on the village of Key Biscayne. Um, the reason the village of Key Biscayne is interested in this is because uh, they had several advisories last year, which they considered to be unacceptable. And they're interested in looking at the potential sources, hoping to find a way in which to manage these sources in a better way. So we have three phases to the project. Um, the first phase is to look at correlations between operations at the Central Dis District Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is shown up here on Virginia Key. There's an outfall that discharges um, treated sewage. That outfall is about 15 kilometers away from the beach. And we're looking at correlations between the operation of that plant, such as flows, chlorine residuals, fecal indicator bacteria at the plant versus what we see at the beach. We're also conducting what's called a microbial source tracking study to look at sources of human, whether or not that enterococci comes from human or from animal sources. And the animal sources we're looking at are birds and dogs. And the reason we're interested in identifying the sources is because humans, we share a lot of diseases. And so if it comes from human, there's more risk. And then um, the third phase, which is more related to what we're doing in this study, is to evaluate other sources, and they include seaweed. So the methods of our study, um, we've been going out monthly to collect um, data, and Peter's going to describe that. So our methods involve taking physical and chemical measurements of our um, water, sand, and seaweed samples. We also take weather measurements such as wind, uh, speed, temperature, humidity, whether it rained on that day or not, and tidal height. And we uh, count the number of humans and animals within a 100 uh, foot range on either side of our sampling site. So we take three water samples at angle depth, knee depth, and waist depth. Um, we take sand samples at the supertidal zone, which is the zone farthest from the ocean. We also take samples uh, from the zone where the sand is integrated with the seaweed. Um, two other zones we take samples from are the intertidal zone, which is just next to the water, and the subtidal zone, which um, is sand submerged by the water. We also take um, seaweed samples from the seaweed we find scattered in our sampling range. So here's a picture of dry of the uh, dry integrated seaweed. So our results for the water samples are that the, the lowest bacterial concentrations are found in the waste deep water. Um, the regulatory limit is set by this zone. So if any of the values here exceed 71 CFUs per 100 milliliters, then the beach would be closed. But um, interestingly, we find higher uh, concentrations of bacteria in the knee and ankle deep water. The highest are in the ankle deep. So here are um, a few examples of the plates for the, the month of June. So we see for the supertidal sand, we have the highest concentration of bacteria. 
it's actually in, in the range where it gets to be uncountable. Um, integrated sand, though it's not obvious, also has um, many colonies. The results for our, our sand sample show that our highest concentrations can be found in the supertidal and the integrated seaweed and sand zone. Um, so for July, the, the value was 89. And in the integrated seaweed and sand zone, and in the lowest values can be found for the subtidal sand, which is submerged by the water. So in the sand zone, typically we see the highest level in the dry sand. And now that the seaweed is integrating, integrated, we're starting to see it in the integrated sand. But we also looked uh, directly at the seaweed. And the first two months, March and April, the seaweed was relatively fresh. Um, it was a light brown color. The levels of bacteria in that seaweed were rel relatively low, single digits, um, CFUs per gram. But then the seaweed started to dry out. And as we proceed through the summer, the, the levels in the seaweed are increasing all the way up to 1,000 CFU per gram in the last month that we sampled. So this gives you an indication of what the seaweed looked like. Again, it was a, a fresher, it's hard to see from these photos, but it was a fresher seaweed at the very beginning. Um, it's um, been dried out. Um, it's much more brittle um, now um, in the more recent times. Um, this also illustrates uh, the different samples of seaweed that we process in the laboratory. And definitely um, in the most recent times, 1,000, you can definitely see that the levels of bacteria in the seaweed have increased significantly. Looking at the moisture content of the seaweed, um, the first two months it had a higher moisture content of about 77, 76%. Whereas in the more recent months, which, which is when we're seeing the higher levels, the moisture content's on the order of 40 to 54%. So it seems as though there's some relationship with moisture. Um, also in more recent months, temperature have gone up. It may be just a coincidence, a covariance, but um, we are uh, looking at the relationship to temperature. We are measuring the temperature in various zones, in the water, in the sand, in the dry sand, and also um, in the intertidal sand. But it seems as though right now what we're seeing when, the, when it's warmer, we're seeing higher levels of bacteria in the, inter, in the seaweed. This is all the data put together. And as you can see here, we have the water, the water sample, and the water is consistently below the 71 CFU per 100 mil especially in the waist deep water, which is where regu regulatory values are taken. We also see that in the sand samples um, shown here, then the general trend from dry sand to subtidal sand gets, um, has lower levels. Uh, during the last two sampling runs, we started taking samples from the integrated sand seaweed line, and we're starting to see elevated levels um, in that line. And of course, we had the seaweed samples um, showing the highest levels. This plot here um, is a little misleading because it's a log scale. So we're exaggerating the bottom part of the scale here. Um, and so, but regardless, you can see that the relative levels of the uh, various uh, concentrations of enterococci. So in conclusion, um, we're seeing high enterococci concentrations in seaweed, maybe related to the water temperature. Uh, we are also find that the drier the seaweed, the higher the enterococci levels. We're also seeing that um, the levels of enterococci in seaweed can be higher than what we're finding in the, in the supertidal sand, the dry sand, and in the integrated sand. So at this point, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Well, the higher level as you go on and it dries up, it will be more because of the composition of the, of the organic matter you can hold to the bacteria starts growing. But yeah, I don't think the seaweed is the source. Let's just repeat the questions for the folks in the webcast. Okay, so the question is, if I can re-emphasize um, it, is that the dry seaweed may not, may be causing growth. Of, decomposition. Or the decomposition is causing the growth. Yeah, I, I, again, it's a hypothesis, but I don't think the seaweed is the source of the bacteria. I, I believe that the seaweed is promoting conditions by which the bacteria can survive and persist. Um, enterococci are sensitive to UV light. The seaweed may provide some protection from light. Um, also, they're sensitive to moisture. Enterococci isn't sensitive to moisture. It may provide some additional moisture. As it decomposes, it may provide nutrients to the bacteria so that they can also uh, persist and survive. So I, I, I don't necessarily think that it's the source, but I think it contributes to 
wherever it's coming from, it contributes to, to them staying there. At the highest point, uh, Peter, you can explain if you like. You can explain it, but it's okay. right above the high tide line. What's the, the question? Oh, so, sorry. Um, the question is, how do we collect the sample at in the supra tidal zone above the high tide line? So at what point in the tide do we collect? That means that no, I think it's the supra tidal, the dry, yeah. the dry. Oh, um, so we uh, we basically take the surface of the sand and the. We take the uh, sample of the surface of the sand, and um, I think it's at low tide. So. Uh, we, we go out at 12 noon every Monday, yeah. because that's when Miami-Dade um, Department of Health collects samples. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. but it's right above the high tide line. It's right above the high tide. Okay, so, uh, so here are a couple of questions from the web. The first one, have you uh, taken samples of treptococci? Uh, or... Uh, Streptococci. Yeah, strep uh -huh. yeah. Obviously, I'm not the, the chemist. Here. <laughs> or E. coli. Okay. Yes, or E. coli. Um, those are they're very similar. In uh, E. coli is also a gastrointestinal bacteria. It's natural inhabitor of, of uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the U.S. EPA issues two sets of advisories. Um, one is based on enterococci, which is used for marine waters. They recommend E. coli for fresh water. We have analyzed E. coli at beaches in the past. Um, for this study, we're only looking at enterococci because that's what's regulated um, in marine waters. So, um, but the E. coli, they, they all follow more or less similar patterns. Okay, great. Another question from the web. What is the cost of your monitoring program annually? And I'll go ahead and ask another one here from the web. What are the principal risks of that bacteria pollution? Okay. So costs and then risks of bacteria pollution. The costs depend on exactly what needs to be done. Um, of course, there are costs with materials and supplies and the need to go out and collect samples. So it would be on a per sample, but you know, it depends on how you design your sampling program and how many samples you have. Um, uh, in those numbers, you know, there's a per sample basis cost. Um, but I think the, the, the bulk of the cost really is in man manpower and labor and being able to design the program to actually carry it out and then to interpret it. So it would depend on um, students, uh, involving students and including them um, in, the, in the budget, I would say. And you had a second question? Yes, uh, where are the principal risks of that bacteria pollution? The principal risk of that bacteria, of enterococci, the US EPA has done epidemiologic studies, and what they find is that there's a relationship between enterococci and gastrointestinal disease. Um, about five to six years ago, we also did an epidemiologic study here um, in Miami-Dade County, and we found a relationship between enterococci and skin ailments. Um, so it's related to human health effects, predominantly gastrointestinal is the traditional viewpoint, but it can also, we have seen links with skin. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so for folks in the web, we are switching the slides now for Derek's. <coughs> Is it right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just let me just click on a few things here. Michel, do you see the full slide yes. on the webcast? Yes? Yep, that, that image? Oh, so it might be taking... It's there? Okay, perfect. All right, use your microphone if you want to use it. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, can you hear me okay, or do you want me to use the mic? Can you hear me all right? Perfect. Um, so my name is Derek Burkholder. I'm a research scientist at Nova Southeast University. Um, I'm going to 
bring it back a little bit. We've been talking a lot. Um, thank you, Leaky, and everybody for the you know the background about sargassum and, and what's going on with it. I'm going to bring it back a little bit to um, you know some of the impacts and the benefits that some of the animals like sea turtles um, you know have with these things. So. Just a little bit of background first. Um, worldwide, we have seven different species of sea turtles. Um, these range everywhere from, you know, the, the top row there, we got the loggerheads, greens, leatherbacks. Um, we've got hawksbills, kemps, and olive ridley. And then that bottom one is the only one that we don't have in this area, and that's the Australian flatback turtle. Um, in South Florida, uh, we've got, we, we get five of these species um, with the loggerhead, green, and leatherbacks nesting on our beaches. Um, we do have a few hawksbill nests in Florida each year, but very, very low numbers. Um, and the same with the Kemp's Ridley. Uh, Olive Ridleys, again, we see in other parts of the Caribbean, but not here in Florida. So offshore, we do get the Kemp's and the, the hawksbill turtles, but they aren't coming up on the beaches. Um, so with sea turtles, of these seven species, all are um, either threatened or endangered worldwide. And this is primarily due to human impact. Um, you know, they've been over harvested, um, interactions in trawl fisheries, things like that for many, many years. Um, all these species are federally and state protected. And um, because of that, we see a lot of different conservation efforts at all fronts um, for these animals. One of the things we see a lot here in Florida, um, we're looking at the nesting surveys. So, you know, if you go to any beaches in Florida right now, you're going to see flagged off areas all over the beaches. Those are our sea turtle nests like you see in the bottom picture here. Um, we've got rehabilitation centers that are taking some of these dead, sorry, the sick and injured uh, sea turtles and trying to bring them back to health and release them again. Stranding response, again, trying to document exactly what's happening with these animals, uh, whether it's boat strike injuries, um, fibropapilloma virus, all these different things. Um, and then obviously education is a big part of it as well. So um, as we're conducting our work on the beach, uh, we're, we're speaking to, you know, beachgoers, but also reaching out to the public in general to try to tell people a little bit more about these animals. Um, so why do we care? Why are we talking about sea turtles at a sargassum uh, working group today? Well, like I said before, all of these seven species are threatened or endangered worldwide. Um, but sea turtles in general provide a unique link between these marine and terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, they can facilitate with their nesting nutrient trans transport of these um, marine nutrients up onto the beach and dune environments. As they come up to, to lay their eggs, they dig their um, nests in the sands, deposit their eggs, head back to the water. So they're bringing those nutrients, um, leaving it on the beaches and facilitating that trans transport of nutrients in and out. Um, many of these species are often the largest grazers um, in the ecosystems where they live. So. Um, they can impact everything from the invertebrate communities, seagrass structure, composition, nutrient content, and detrital cycles in these different areas. So just a couple of examples, green turtles, for instance, um, primarily feeding on seagrasses and algae. Uh, these guys have been found that they can actually um, repeatedly crop certain um, seagrass meadows and can change the nutrient content of those areas and can actually structure what species are actually growing in these areas in these foraging grounds. Uh, loggerhead turtles, primarily feeding on the crunchy things out there, so they can um, impact our invertebrate populations, oysters, clams, things like that. <clears throat> and then coming down to the hawksbills, um, these guys are spongivores on the reef. Uh, they've got a nice pointy beak. They can actually go in and pick out those sponges, um, and they can have a huge impact on sort of the health of our reef systems. Uh, without these guys, some of our um, the sponge communities can outcompete corals and change it from that nice healthy coral community to, to a, you know, more algae driven, something like that, that can actually wipe out some of these corals. So these are all very interconnected species um, and they play a big, big role in these areas where they are. Um, so as we talk about the sea turtle life cycle, there are a couple places, um, as Leaky and Emilio said before, that this isn't cut and dry. Um, these, these, Sargassomats play vital roles for sea turtles in a couple different parts of their life cycle. So as we just said, uh, the moms come up to the beaches, they dig a nest, deposit 80 to 120 eggs on average, they sit there for a couple of months, hatch, the babies head out to sea. Um, once those eggs hatch, um, the babies head out and they go into something we call the lost years. 10 to 15 years that we 
think they just are heading out and they're, you know, they, they power straight offshore. And what they're doing is they're looking for that sargasso. So what they do is once they find that, um, this provides essential habitat for these young hatchlings um, because once they hit that sargasso mat, these provide places of protection, um, provide great food sources for these, these young um, hatchlings. And it also provides a place where they can, um, you know, a habitat that allows them to um, thermoregulate. They can, you know, if, get, if they start getting cold, they move to the top of the sargassum, get a little bit more of that heat up top. If they start getting warm, they can tuck underneath, get into the shade. Um, but again, the, the plant itself, but also the, the micro community, the, you know, the, the other plants and animals that live there provide a huge amount of food for these animals. Um, and these hatchlings are going to ride, um, you know, ride the currents, circle the Sargasso Sea, float around in these mats for the, for the next 10 to 15 years of their life. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the um, impact as essential habitat, Sargasso also provides a huge impact on the dune environment where they're laying their nests. Um, so that little bit of Sargasso is actually incredibly important. It's again, bringing nutrients in which fertilizes dune vegetation. That dune vegetation plays a big role in stabilizing our beaches, stabilizing our dunes. Um, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars replenishing our beaches. Um, there's very few places in Florida um, over the years that hasn't seen some amount of renourishment, especially in places like South Florida, um, where we have to bring in sand to replace things that are, are being washed away. These you know, natural dune systems help hold the sand there, and that's really uh, fueled by some of this sargassum and other things coming up to um, bring, that, um, bring those nutrients in. But like anything, um, we can have too much of a good thing, and that's what we're seeing in some places. Um, as we start to get these massive blooms that we've been talking about today, um, we can start to impact these animals being able to come up to the beach. So what we'd like to see is this up here at the top. We see the crawl where the mom comes in, she digs in the sand, lays her nest, covers it up, and then heads back to the water. When we see some of these massive blooms, she then can't get into the beaches anymore. Um, it can stop her physically getting to the beach, and if she does get to the beach, she might be, um, you know, fighting with mounds and, and, you know, mountains of sargassum that she may not even be able to get through. Um, it provides an entanglement and a drowning risk. These are marine reptiles, they're, they're coming to the surface to breathe. Um, and when they get into, the, again, these denser patches, they may not be able to actually get up through that um, sargassum mat to get to the surface. And we are seeing deaths of not only adults, but also the hatchlings. That The ones that do make it in, maybe they had a, a, an area of you know, a little bit lower density, they laid their nest. When those hatchlings come out, they all boil up, they're ready to head back to the beach or head back to the water. But when they're encountering this as well, they can't get through that mat and they may end up, um, you know, dying on the beach or something like that before they can get back out there. Um, and the last thing is this, this sargassum, as we just heard, can have a big impact on, um, you know, what's going on within the sand and stuff as well. And that can in inhibit gas exchange. So this is what we're looking at with a sea turtle nest. They dig, dig anywhere from three to seven feet below the surface, lay those eggs, pack it back down. But in that nest, in that microcosm there, there is gas exchange within the eggs. Um, so when we start to get these piles and turn that into an anoxic situation, that can actually smother these nests and, and stop that, that um, gas exchange through the eggs and can actually kill those eggs and the hatchlings within the nest. Um, same thing, when you get these mountains of sargassum, uh, water coming in may not always be able to get back out and that can actually create a situation where what would have been a nest that got washed over by water that then went back out and might get trapped and actually um, you know, drown those nests as well. So we do see impacts um, at all sides. So just to kind of bring it back, um, sargassum is an extremely, extremely important part of the sea turtle life cycle from their essential habitat at those younger um, life stages, providing uh, food, um, resources, Back to the nesting beaches, they provide dune stabilization, um, hold that sand there a little bit better. Um, but we can get to the point at which we are seeing in some areas where we have too much of a good thing. And that can start to block nesting attempts, um, trapping and tangling these animals, and um, can impede gas exchange. So as we are talking today, I do want to definitely um, emphasize that we see um, that these are important, but we do need to sort of bring 
these marine animals into these discussions as well because it is you know good and bad um, for everything going on. Great, thank you. Thank you. So for the Q&A we'll do three minutes so we can be on time with our break. So let's uh, start the timer now. Any questions from uh, inside the room? So the question is, are we seeing any impact as these animals do die? Is it having any more impact on the sargassum itself? Um, and to be honest, there hasn't been enough research done yet. We are still at that point where um, we're seeing these things happen, and now we're trying to figure out what impacts we are going to see from that. So we, we don't know yet if that is impacting any more of the sargassum situation that's going on. Any other questions uh, from the room? How about online on the web? Okay, here we go. Um, are there reports, this from the web, are there reports of drownings in large offshore mats or is this only a beach phenomenon? All right, so um, are we seeing these drownings offshore or is it just at the beach? And I think it's largely at the beach. Offshore, um, these mats are moving around enough. There's enough pockets that these animals are able to make their way up. Uh, the, the real impacts come when it gets piled in against the beach and it's so dense that um, they can't get under it, they can't get over it, they can't get through it, and that's where we start to see the issues, is, is where it gets piled in against a fixed structure like the beach. Okay, another question from the room, Luis. Yes, uh, do all uh, uh, Florida sea turtles, they also have the same life cycle in which they spend, uh, they have to be like 10 to 15 years in Sargasso, all of them. Yes, yeah, so th the question is, do all species of sea turtles see that same life history where they're spending the 10 to 15 years um, in the sargassum? And, and we do think so, yeah. The, some of these species, there may, there may be a little bit of a time difference, but that those first 10 years or so, 10, 15 years, all of these animals, as they leave the beach, they go into this, this frenzy, swimming frenzy, um, where they head offshore until they find sargassum, and then they're going to hang out there for, for the next good bunch of time. Yeah, that's all species. Okay, we have two more questions from the web here. One of them, this may be more uh, directed at Florida. Is a sargassum currently at the beach helpful for turtles? Another question is, is it more important to clear the beach at a small risk of damaging nests or vice versa? All right. So um, from what we've seen so far, you know, other than, you know, hatchlings may be working a little bit harder to get back to the beach. From what we've seen in most places in Florida, don't think there's any um, impact yet uh, on these sea turtles. Um, but what was the second one there? Is it more important to clear the beach at a small risk okay. of damaging nests or vice versa? So when we're talking about clearing the beaches, uh, with usually with mechanical beach cleaning in South Florida anyway, um, the, you know, the biggest risk is going to be not so much to the nest itself because those are flagged off the beach cleaners stay away from those they're not running over those areas um, the biggest is just being careful to hopefully not sweep up hatchlings that might be still making their way through that sargassum getting back to the water thank you derek thank you very much okay so for the folks in the web and and over here uh, physically present we're taking a break now up to uh 10 35. thank you Oh, there, there is coffee outside, so if you go past the fish tank, yeah, the there's bathroom. a cafeteria area. Restrooms are down the hallway, that way and to the left before you leave the building. Okay, so folks on the web, um, we will have a placeholder slide here uh, during the break. And, uh, and Joe, if you can hear me online, uh, I would like to uh, start testing with the system with you a couple of minutes uh, before we are off break, so around 10... Uh, Thank you. 
Okay, Joe, um, can you hear me? Can you say something? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Joe, I, I can't hear you. Can you uh, go ahead and say something again? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm right here. Yes, yes, we can hear you now in the room uh, clearly. Um, let me uh, let me see. Do you see my slide, Joe? Yeah, I can see. Okay, perfect. Let me check something here in the webcast. Perfect. I need to send a chat here. If if you're in the webcast, uh, do you hear two people speaking? Can you hear Joe? Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Emilio, you're still on private to my chat, so you send me the, the chat, the private chat. Okay, great. So now, um, Joe, do you see the chat that I sent to everyone? Yep. Yep. That's fine. Okay, perfect. So let me. Uh, work some things out over here in the room. Marcel, let's get ready with the timer. So let's make it. No, there, there are lots of people that still haven't come back into the room, Joe, so we're going to hang on for a couple of minutes, okay? It's okay, no problem. We'll be back. Uh, Joe, if you can type there in the chat that we'll, uh, we'll start Let's say in uh, three to five minutes, that would be good. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, folks, we're about to get started. Okay, we're about to get started again. Joe, uh, can you hear me there on the webcast? Yeah, hello, everybody. Good morning. Hi, right, Joe. We just need one more minute so everybody can, uh, can sit down. We're all getting situated here in the room, so we're about to get started. We have folks on the web. Perfect. All ready to go. So, um, I, Joe, I won't give uh, too much of an introduction to you, but so everybody in the room knows and on the web, uh, Joao Gonzalez, he is actually with us. Uh, he's in Mexico, so he's joining us uh, via the webcast. And this is what we meant by having uh, the international collaboration um, from several groups. And now, Joe, I, I know you're not going to say uh, talk too much about your vast experience, but you know, Joe is a scientist and he also has experience in the industry. Uh, you know, implementing anchors and he has a lot of experience with barriers in Mexico. So I think he's a, quite a unique speaker because he's going to uh, help to uh, bridge the gap a bit between the scientific community and some of the industry speakers that we will have as well. So uh, Joe, why don't you uh, go ahead and take it from here? Yeah, thank you very much, Emilio. Uh, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, as you were saying, uh, yeah, uh, we are actually in the field. We are um, in the water, as you can see that picture below. This is how we work every day. And uh, we are implementing the anchoring. Uh, I joined this Ancla Marina um, company uh, last year, where they're specialized in anchors, uh, marine anchors. And this was the, the first and most important failure of the barriers they installed last year, because they didn't have clue how to how to ground them or how, how to hold it from the from the marine floor, right? So if you can put the next one. Okay, just one second here. Thank you. Is that the next slide? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, this is just a sample of different types of uh, sargasso booms or barriers that they've been installing here in Mexico. There is different companies. Uh, I can count mm, at least 12 or more. And everybody's trying to implement some different stuff. Uh, they, some of them are more effective than the other ones, but it's very important uh, that we have the barriers. Uh, if you can put the next slide, we'll analyze the pros and cons. Next one, and next. Yeah, it's very important to avoid the sargassum of reaching the beach. Why? Because we have the main problem with the sargassum is not the sargassum itself, it's the decomposition of the sargassum. So when the sargassum stops moving and it reaches the coast and the beach is when the problem starts because it's decomposing, it's creating the, the acidic and the anoxic waters that we already talked about. And uh, also, once that it reaches the, the, the beach, it's gonna be uh, all sandy and uh, dirty, so it's more difficult to clean as well. Plus you will be eroding the, the beaches. So it's very important to have or, or try to stop it when it's still floating. Because also with the barriers, it will be making it easier to redirect the sargassum to a certain point where you can collect it easier. Instead of having to clean a one kilometer of beach, you can, you can redirect, redirect the sargassum and then just have a few meters where you're gonna collect the sargassum. So your efforts are gonna be uh, uh, directed only to a one place. And if it's properly installed and maintained, it could last several years. Uh, mainly the people putting barriers here are the hotel uh, owners and stuff that they want to protect beaches and also some, some government. The government are hiring some of the companies as well. But the idea is also to, uh, to have barriers that it can last a little longer and don't have to do the investment uh, every year, right? Uh, as I was saying, uh, for investment, it's not enough, uh, the cons that we are gonna check is not enough just to buy it by itself. We need to, we need to keep it, we need to maintain it because that's gonna uh, prolong the life of your barrier, right? If it's not clean from the sargassum accumulation, it could be counterproductive, why? because when the sargassum stops moving, the sun is gonna start killing the sargassum, even if it's floating uh, on the side of the barrier, and that's gonna make it uh, go down or drown when it's decomposing and it will pass underneath the barrier. There is also very important to consider some regulations that we have to put these barriers. It's not just to close the beach and that's it. There is some type of uh, alignments that we have in Mexico as well, depending on the, on the size of the barrier, to allow marine, uh, uh, marine animals to go underneath. So we cannot just cover and, cl and close an area. So it's very important to have that in mind. And also if it's not properly, uh, the, the, the proper type 
or is installed properly, it will be more harmful than beneficial. If you put these barriers too close to the reef, uh, the, the sargasso accumulation is going to start creating shade for the, for the reef, for example. And if it starts dying, it will be on top of the reef. So it will be more harmful than, than helpful and beneficial. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I, I was just mentioning some of the companies that they have in Sargassum. I won't go in detail to all of them. But as I said, there is more than 12 to 15 different uh, companies that are trying to do efforts uh, it, producing or developing a different type of uh, sargasso barriers. Uh, last year, they started with the sargasso, with the barriers that they're actually made for oil spills. And they try to improve these with sargasso, but it's totally different story. Uh, sargasso moves differently, it's heavier, and it's just not enough to have like an oil spill barrier. Also, it puts a lot of tension uh, with the waves and the, and the currents. So they break, they break very badly. Uh, next one, please. Okay, Joe, just so you know, we have uh, two more minutes. We're Perfect. trying to catch up on time. Okay, so if we can go fast through this one. Uh, what we do to anchor the, the barriers first is a bottom prospect prospection because we need to know what kind of uh, bottom we have. We have uh, sandy bottoms where we are going to use anchors that they go two meters underneath the sand to hold the barriers. And we need uh, pins for a hard substrate. Uh, the picture on the right where you see the cement blocks as that weight is wrong. We should not use these ones because the barriers are gonna drag them on the bottom and they're gonna start killing the either reef or uh, seagrass and seabeds. Next one. Research is fundamental as well because we need to consider current tides, wind, depth, and everything to make it uh, function properly, right? Uh, the first picture you see a barrier that he just put right there in the middle of nowhere and it has no research whatsoever. Uh, as I said, uh, it has to be a proper barrier uh, to not interfere with the marine life so marine life can pass underneath. So it's only a maximum of 60 to 70 centimeters below the surface where you should be in the barrier and it's also essential to be clean it so right now in mexico we have a lot of like little boats and uh, sargasso boats to start cleaning the, the back of the barriers and uh, don't allow the accumulation to start killing the sargasso when it's still floating over there next one Great. so we have about one minute yep uh, if you fail to install the anchors this is what happens these are pictures of, of uh, barriers that they were washed up to shore because they were not properly installed and this is what could happen. And you could see uh, on the right side, the, the color of the water once the, the, the accumulation of sargasso goes to the beach. I think that's the last one. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, Marcel, can you please add three minutes there for Q&A? Yes. Uh, what has been the level of understanding or study done of impacts from the areas on marine life that seagrows marine mammals and if they have been Share. Joe, were you able to hear that? No, I couldn't. No? Okay, so the question is, um, what kinds of studies have been performed regarding the impacts of barriers on sea life and turtles and things of that nature? Uh, well, this is very important. You know that the start, start making uh, uh, experiments with marine life is, is difficult. Uh, uh, we have agreed with some of the people working with turtles to try to do a test with the hatchlings actually passing underneath the barrier. But we haven't had to that stage. We need the, the proper permits for the Secretaria. And then uh, we might have to try something this year. But uh, of the record, I can tell you that when we were installing one of the barriers, uh, they liberated some hatchlings on the far side of the beach where there was no barrier. And the next day, the next morning, the, one of the turtles was inside the area where there is barrier. So if he came inside, I'm pretty sure he could come outside. So uh, the important thing as well is that properly installed and is, is the tension of the, of the barrier uh, is, is going to allow uh, the marine life to pass and not get entangled on it. Great, great. Any other questions from the folks here in Miami? Yes. Are there... Uh, Permitted, uh, meaning barriers that have uh, the authority to be used uh, in the United States? That I wouldn't know. Okay. Any, any other questions from the folks here in Miami? Yes, Luis Rodriguez. Uh, in, in 
in terms of the installation of the barriers, um, do they you do they realize like a continuous long barrier, or do they uh, they have a specific strategy in terms of like sections to allow uh, water flow in between barriers? But if you have this, if you just speak a little bit about that. Joe, can you speak a bit about the uh, strategy in terms of the length of barriers that are implemented, how they're connected, and uh, and what what process do you go about when determining uh, the length of barrier and placement? Well, the, uh, at the moment, uh, the length of the barrier it depends on the length of the property that they're going to be installed. Basically, if you have a hotel with two two kilometers, that's the barrier it's going to be. Uh, the government uh, right now imp improved like a two kilometer barrier for the front beach of Puerto Morelos, for example. So, um, well, the ideal for me, uh, maybe living in a perfect world, it would be to cover the whole coast, right? But um, yeah, that's, that's very difficult to do or almost impossible. So um, you have to have places as well where you're going to recover these sargassum so you can just cover the thing and then let it let it there so we need maintenance that's that's the key uh, the connection of the barriers it depends on the provider of the barrier they have different different type of connections thank you uh, thank you joe and uh we'll take one question that i see here from the web yeah and then we'll move on to the next speaker because the time has run out so what level of sea swells make barriers ineffective we have seen that uh, if we have winds of like 30 k's, 30 k's per hour is around 18 knots, I believe, or something like that, then the swell is way too high for pretty much all of the barriers. And also, it's very important to know that we are in an area where there is hurricanes and storms. So if we are going to have uh, higher winds than that, you will need to remove the barriers. Otherwise, they're going to be teared apart and they will be on the beach, on shore and it will be worthless. So when there's a storm, you need to be able to take that thing out of the water. Thank you, Joe. Thank You're you, everybody welcome. that participated. So now we will switch. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presenter will be Dwayne Benish. He's from the company Elastic. So, uh, Marcel, can you have um, five minutes there on the, on the timer? Dwayne, five minutes, and, uh, and if you, you're standing here is ideal, so people can hear you on the web. So I could, hello? So I could talk about this topic all day. Um, I have uh, Elastic's barrier over in the corner there. Please see me afterwards because uh, I'm not going to cover all this in five minutes. But um, I, I will uh, uh, continue to uh, go with what Joel had already said about the floating barriers, that installation is the most important thing uh, when putting a barrier in. And, and he mentioned anchoring. Uh, anchoring is, is uh, you know, outside of the design of the barrier, the most important thing and, and probably the most costly thing, which is why it gets skimped on when these barriers are put in the water. Um, Elastec has a company, uh, We've been making floating barriers since 1967. Um, and it wasn't until 2015 where we started getting calls about this seaweed. Uh, and uh, the first place that I visited, and I've been all over the Caribbean looking at this, swimming in it, seeing all the flies and birds and, and the smell. And uh, I, I, I've been in this stuff in a number of different places. But the first place I went was the Dominican Republic. And I watched an entire bay fill up with this invasion of seaweed. And, and it, it was thick and swimming and it's like a mud and it's like trudging through almost like a muck wall just to get through this. And, and there's, there's just all kinds of nastiness with, with birds eating flies and, and there's gnats and it's it just the, the smell you can smell at the resort entrance a mile before you actually get to the beach. Um, so we, we set out to, um, well, we, we were quoting oil boom. Like I think every company that, that built floating barriers were like, ah, oh, oil boom, it flows, it's just like oil. It's not, oil boom does not work. We had to create a new product, a whole new product called the Beach Bouncer. And that's what you see in the corner over there and what you see on the screen. So why a floating barrier? And, and Joel hit on some of these, uh, the cleanup costs. And I didn't even put in here the loss of, uh, the loss of revenues just uh you know i included the, the you know the cost of the equipment and the, and the folks that um you need to get out there and, and clean it up and in mexico and belize it's guys with pitchforks 
and in other locations, it's, uh, you know, it's backhoes. There's a place, uh, Porta Morales, I think he mentioned, um, they take 50, in a day, they take 50 dump trucks uh, out of that place with, with seaweed. So, um, so cleanup costs are huge, the loss of revenues, the loss of tourism dollars for restaurants in the area. Um, you know, people don't want to go to a resort. I was in a, I was in Belize and I'm, I'm going with a couple who probably booked their vacation because of the beautiful pictures they saw in, at this Belizean resort. Unfortunately, I was headed to the resort on the same bus to help them out with their seaweed problem. So they didn't know anything about it and they were very dejected when they got out of the bus and the, and the, the odor hit them. Um, so swimming in the, in, in the um, you know, if, if you don't have a barrier out there and the seaweed is coming in, you, you're swimming in it. You're cleaning it off the beach, but it's still in the water. You can't swim. And hatchlings will have a hard time getting out uh, into the water. Uh, the smell is just, if you've ever been to one of these places, and I haven't been to uh, the Florida beaches yet. My experience is only in the Caribbean. It's just now reached the Florida coast is in, in mass. So I haven't actually uh, smelled how bad it is out there. Uh, but when an entire bay fills up with it, it's pretty bad. Um, the bugs and the birds, I already spoke about that. Um, the cleanup noise. So there's resorts doing heavy equipment work from, from in the evenings until the mornings. And it's this beep, 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 you know, the machines backing up to collect this seaweed, the dump trucks and stuff. Um, and then also you do have loss of sand uh, at your beach. So the seaweed does a great job in small amounts of keeping the beach together and providing nutrients for the grasses that hold the beach together. But when you get a lot of it and now you're out there scooping it up, it's also holding that sand that you're removing. So what doesn't work? Turbidity curtains don't work. They're great for short duration uh, projects uh, to control silt and sediment uh, around short term construction projects, but they're not built to last. Oil booms, oil booms are too shallow. They, they allow the, uh, the, the seaweed right underneath them. Um, anything with a solid skirt is just gonna lift up with the loading of the seaweed. It all goes underneath and goes to the beach and then it goes down and starts containing again until that loading happens again. And net booms, um, you know, netting or, or booms with holes in it um, that allow seaweed to get trapped. They sink, it traps the seaweed and the weight of the seaweed now sinks the barrier. You know, a, a, a barrier like that that has a 12 inch float with 50 pounds uh, per foot buoyancy sinks when that seaweed hits that net. So we've done a lot of work with creating what we feel is the sweet spot with barriers. Um, we have a barrier with a skirt that allows water to flow through it. So it alleviates that loading of the water and the seaweed pushing on it. Um, we've created a barrier that um, has a heavy ballast chain that keeps that down in the water. And then of course, uh, the anchoring of it is, is very important and that needs to be done every 25 feet. So you can imagine there's going to be a lot of anchors in the water. Thank you, Dwayne, and, yep. and, and sorry that we had to uh, cut your presentation short to okay. make up time for others. Um, I'll blame myself. No, no worries. Timekeeper um, and Marcel. My timekeeper. No, I'm kidding. Uh, he's great. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a question from the web, and then we'll take one in person. What are the performance metrics for the floating barriers in terms of sargassum? Uh, it, 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 as far as what we do when we when we get someone who's interested in in protecting their resort, first thing we want to know is all the water conditions in the uh, in the area. We want to know uh, first of all we need a Google Earth shot of where they want to put it. And we can make recommendations there based on our knowledge of previous installations. Uh, but we want to take into account the wind, uh, the flow rate, and also the wave height, and and also where is that uh, you know where is that wind coming from that could possibly be creating waves. And, and, and again, these barriers don't work in breaking wave situations. They need to be out past the breaker. Great. Uh, sir, you yes, had a question? Max, have you considered that your product led some of the sargassum going into the beach because that is a natural occurrence when we didn't have the, the excessive sargassum? Yeah, so the question is, um, if you put a barrier out there that's going to work to control all the seaweed, and some of that seaweed is beneficial to come into the beach, um, isn't that an issue? And, and yes, it is. And I would say, um, you know, there's, there's certain months where the seaweed isn't as, uh, isn't as bad as others, um, but that's going to be a resort decision um, based on, you know, loss of income, uh, those sort of things. So um, that's really... You know, we're, we're trying to keep it all out. 
Okay, let's take a couple more questions from the crowd. We only have a minute. So, yes, sir, you and then you. I don't know if somebody asked earlier, but um, let's say Florida, uh, they might approach DEP or federal state agency in terms of permitting the stuff and allowing it in our coast here? Or? So, yeah, the question is, are, are, uh, is this permitted to install in the water in Florida? And we do have customers in the Florida Keys with this barrier in the water and have since 1994, but probably they didn't go through any kind of permitting process <laughs> in order to put those in the water. So, um, you know, we're working with the city of Key West right now on a couple of different places. Uh, but yeah, permitting is where we're kind of stuck with regards to Florida currently. So we're working on that. Great, so we have the last question, uh, sir. The same question, okay, let's, uh, let's take one more question then from the room. Yes, ma'am. Right, so um, the question is, um, what about the mother sea turtles coming into nests? Will they be able to, will they be hindered by the barrier? And, and um, I, the, the, we, we would love to have someone take a look at our barrier and kind of certify it. And that hasn't been done yet. The only thing we did was, I knew of a, um, a marine biologist that worked at the local zoo up in, we're, we're, we're manufactured this in Cocoa, Florida. So we went to uh, her at the zoo and she said, oh, the sea turtles are very adaptable. You're, you're not going all the way to the bottom of this. And I said, no, we're only going three feet down into the water. So it's a surface boom. You know, this is going to be installed in 10 feet or more of water. And maybe this is a sea turtle question for, for, for the room, but, um, you know, they, they should swim underneath it just like they swim under the mass of seaweed. So as long as you're not going all the way to the bottom and you're giving them that, you know, wide berth to get underneath, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what we're thinking. But yes, we are working on that part of it as well. We'd love to have a little a little piece of paper to walk around and some certification say this person said you know great thank you thank, thank you. you very much you. okay so for the folks in the web we are now switching the presentation so alejandro let's actually let's make it up three minutes marcel Marcel, three minutes. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Emilio, for uh, inviting me to this presentation. Um, I made the presentation very, very short. It's going to be like two or three slides because I already knew that uh, all the speakers before uh, before me were going to give a very good uh, approach to this problem and probably, you know, even more than me about the sarcasm right now. Um, we are a company that have been working on the beach for the last 40 years worldwide. We do remove it of any kind of debris and uh, we develop different equipment to remove sargassum from the beach. Um, and so I'm, sure, uh, I'm going to make the presentation very short because I'm sure that you probably have many questions. But just to let you know, we have permits from the state of Florida to remove the sargassum for the last three years. Um, we're working in different municipalities right now to approach this problem. One of the municipalities is, is La Morada. Um, we're going to do a test very soon. We did some cleaning last year in Bad Harbor. And uh, we're working also with other uh, entities to remove the sargassum from the water uh, probably at the beginning of next year. We don't have a specific solution for um, for, uh, for the beach. We have to uh, study the project for the beach, for the area, the size of the beach, uh, the problem with the, with the turtles, currents, etc. So we cannot give uh, a specific or a, a general approach to, uh, to anyone saying, hey, how much is it going to cost to remove the, the, the sargassum in terms of the square footage or anything like that. We have to study the project and, and, and develop the plan for that specific area. This is one of the equipment that we have to remove some sargassum from the beach, actually, uh, when it's on the sand. There are other equipment right now on the market, but I'm proud to say that this one probably the only one that is able to remove sargassum 
without removing uh, sand, which is one of the biggest problems right now uh, when people start talking about removing sargassum or even removing any other kind of debris on the beach, um, that you know, it, it makes erosion and removes a lot of sand. As one of the speakers mentioned before, um, it is true that in South Florida, there are uh, big renourishment projects every year, uh, basically by the U.S. Corps of Engineering. And uh, this equipment, as I say, and you can see on, the, on those pictures, it just removes sargassum. It doesn't remove really sand. <coughs> we also have boats to remove some sargassum from the water. As um, um, presenters mentioned before, uh, the barriers are a complement and you need to keep uh, maintaining that part of the of the barrier. You have to remove the sargassum because at the end of the day, the sargassum will get stuck on the barrier and if you don't remove it, it get, it's, get, it's going to actually go over the barrier and uh, you will continue having the same kind of problem. So um, this is probably the only boat. Um, I don't know any other one that is able to work in open waters. Uh, there are other boats and, and we are actually designing even bigger boats, 45 feet, which is in, I um, mean, 45 meters, which is about 150 feet for huge amount of sargassum. And that is something that we're working right now with the uh, government in Mexico. Great. Thank you, Alejandro. Let's have a couple of minutes uh, for Q&A, Marcel. You can, you can start that timer for two minutes. Yes, ma'am. No. Yes. Uh, the question is, what would we do, what we do with, uh, with the sargassum that we remove uh, from, the, from the water with our boats? Um, uh, that's a great question, and, and that's the part of the solution that we are proposing A to C from the beginning to the end. And uh, we are recycling the sargassum right now. We make compost. There are other solutions that someone else mentioned in terms of uh, making bricks. That is something that uh, everybody is uh, listening lately. But at the end of the day, right now, the solutions that are on the market um, related with bricks, for example, is just mixing 1% of, 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 of the uh, raw material at the beginning with sargassum, but we are recycling the sargassum right now into compost. And there are other mun municipalities actually that uh, they were doing compost before here in Florida. And mm, that's the municipality that we're working with right now to remove the sargassum from the water and recycle the sargasso into compost, and the municipality is planning to use that compost or part of that compost uh, uh, for the city. Yes? Yes, uh, yeah, um, they're asking if we analyze the, uh, the, the composition of the compost, right? Um, yes, uh, we are basing in Spain we also have uh, partners and co-workers in Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, they were unable to uh, be present today, but uh, yes, we do analyze the, the material and, and the compost and also what kind of sargassum uh, is the one that we're going to use because as I mentioned before, there are many different species right now. And um, uh, we do uh, study and, and, and do all the chemical testing uh, to see what is the, the result of the compost. Great, so we'll take one more question from the audience. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, uh, they're asking how far and the boat, the, the boat that we are uh, working on, the project that is about 150 feet uh, long, uh, be, be able to work from the coast, right? Um, I, that, I don't have that, uh, that information right now, but I'd be happy to provide it to you. But yes, definitely it's a boat to, to work far away from the coast. Yes, definitely. It's a, it's a very big boat. It is, it is like, a, like a fish factory, really, this kind of boat. Uh, and, we're talking about um, a boat that is able to uh, carry about 1,000 tons of uh, sargassum at once. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you. So now we get to the part of the discussion where we have all of the panelists uh, come to the front, everybody that made a presentation, so we can have uh, 
a good amount of time for some Q&A with the group. Let me open up the slide presentation here. Presenting. For those of you online, can you still hear us and do you see the slide that's up on the screen that says group discussion? Okay, perfect. So everybody sees this. So we have uh, allocated about 10 minutes for this, but we are starting a little late. So let's make it seven minutes on the timer. Starting now. Okay, so let's take questions. And for the presenters, uh, just keep in mind that I need to repeat the, the answer. Now, maybe it's, uh, it's better. I know it'll be a bit awkward but it may be better for there to be one presenter at a time just coming over here because then as you're speaking, folks on the web, they're not going to hear you if you're over there. So how about we do that? Um, let's do it in the order where we presented. So I think Ligia, you were the first one. Right? And, and sorry about that, but due to the, the technical challenges, this is really the only way that it will work. So uh, please go ahead, any questions uh, for Ligia? Well, the paper that is published already by Cicini uh, from Brazil, the markers are not strong enough to make a difference. So, so far we don't know, but there is a group of taxonomists already working and there is a lot of money on, on research already put by the French government, by the Dutch government. So there are other places that are already working with this. So we have now a group where we have people from the University of Alabama and we are creating some protocols trying to have these answers. But there is a lot of alginates that are really creating problems with the markers. So it seems that we are going to be uh, needing people working with the full genome. To make a difference. So far, we know that between natives and fluids, and so we only have one or two species in the floating sargassum, not many of them. So the genus has many species, but only two we know morphologically that are with five or eight morphotypes. So the, the taxonomic problem is still there. And we don't even know if the difference between the north and the south, so the, the, the great belt and the Larry. Lots of work to do. Great, thank you. Again, we're, we're moving lightning fast uh, due to the time, so we can have more time for the discussion around uh, the needs for each different stakeholder group. So uh, any question for Josefina? Gustavo. And, and Gustavo. Please remember to repeat the okay. question. Yeah. Oh. So can you? Can you? No, that's Valentina, yeah. So this is physical oceanography. <laughs> um, I can say something with respect to Brazil that it may not necessarily be uh, algae that is, or seaweed that is coming from Brazil, from the Amazon River, but the Amazon, in that region, there is a current that is called the North Brazil Current. Uh, it goes to the Northwest, it retroflects and in the process of retroflecting sheds rings and those rings are actually taking Amazon River water into the Caribbean Sea. It's very distinctive and is uh, approximately 50 meters deep uh, uh, the signal of this water and that water could be appropriate uh, to even help the reproduction of uh, the sargassum you already had there. And that's, that is maybe, it doesn't match um, the same species, it's not the same species, but the dynamics in the oceans contribute to take whatever you had in the region uh, into the Caribbean Sea. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But I think that was, yeah. but, sorry. Well, 
where we are. So you want to see, yeah, uh, they are asking about the collaboration. And how much collaboration do we have between the groups? Uh, in my case, in particular, not yet. But that's why we are organizing this, and that's why we are getting together to start collaboration. I know there are some collaborations already, and we did uh, grow a proposal together. So we try to get colla collaboration, but we didn't get funded yet. But we are working on that. Uh, and, and some of the collaboration is already started between Noah. Oh, yeah. The University of Miami, NASA, the yeah. University of South Florida, even Spain. We are working together in doing the research for uh, extension and trajectories yeah, of sargas. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Elena, okay. Solo Gabriel, if you can uh, step up any uh, questions that you have for her. Again, we're going very quickly because we want to you know, provide opportunities for the questions and we will have more discussion. Any questions? Yes. Um, the question has to do with the relationship between the sargasm and the beach water quality and the ways in which the sargasm is removed um, to manage that. Uh, that is why we're studying it right now. Uh, we're trying to establish whether or not there is a relationship. Um, we're early on in our study. We've got five months of data. We still have another seven to go. But we do suspect, given what we've already seen with the sargasm as it decays, come, you have very high levels, that um, it is impacting sand quality. It has not yet impacted water quality. So I would assume that there's a certain threshold above which you don't want the sand to exceed a certain level, but we don't, it, as far as when it can potentially impact the water. So we don't know yet um, the overall impacts. It, it still needs to be studied, I, I, I believe. Yeah, the question is, can we provide recommendations to the county and how they're re removing the sargasm? Um, at this point, we'd like to continue doing what we're doing um, and then letting the give the information to the county and then let the county decide what the best approach may be, maybe a combination of approaches. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, Marcel, can you add two minutes there and let's have Valentina and Derek come up together. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so do you have any questions for either of them? Well, I mean, the boom idea is a great idea, and I think the turtles can swim underneath it, but then the question is, actually it's getting back to the water with that boom up there. That's just not going to go. Maybe they will three feet down. I mean, from your experience, would that be a pediment to that as far as a solution? Dealing with the actual actually, not the turtles themselves. So the question is, with the boom, um, control method is our hatchlings are going to be able to get underneath that like the adults would be able to and you know I think largely that would require study you know I don't think we could say either way um, I think with any of these management plans opportunities we have to look at it at a, at a multitude, multitude of different ways you know because with the booms you know as Lee was talking about before when the the sargassum is up on the beach it's killing the seagrass that's underneath it making anoxic when you move the boom out there, now you're just moving that anoxic place over the coral reef or whatever else is further out. So it could have impacts like that. Hatchlings may or may not be able to get underneath it. It would just depend. You know, it's it's hard to know. They they can dive as well, but um, they're not going to be nearly as efficient as the adults are. Um, so I don't I, I couldn't say one way or another if they would be able to effectively do that or not all the time. And if they do. Are they going to come up into a place with so much sargassum they can't get to the surface? 
So it goes both ways. Sir. So the question is, when these hatchlings are coming offshore, if they encounter um, the boom and go underneath it and find this big mat of sargassum, are they going to confuse that for where they're supposed to be going to get out um, and that, that floating mat that they're trying to find? And it, they very well could. You know, they, they are programmed to head offshore and find a suitable location. And if that's right there, they might stop. And then the other side of that comes in, and we saw in some of the photographs the boats cleaning up that sargassum at the booms. That you know, are they going to be picking up all these hatchlings then? And then what happens there? So there's all of this is very interconnected, and we would definitely have to look at it um, across across the board. And I know one thing that um, you had said about the booms before is that um, as far as the permitting and and when they should be there, when not there, that that should be up to the resort that they're protecting. And I personally believe that that's not quite the right answer because they're always going to want to keep their beaches clean. Um, I think, well, it's, it's wrong there too, in my opinion, um, because if they're making those decisions, they're not basing that on the biology, the ecology of these animals and the plants and everything that's in these areas. This, that's why we have permitting agencies like DEP and things like that to take all of these things into consideration and find those best practices. Great, okay, so we just reset the timer for another two minutes. We'll have one question for Valentina, and then Dwayne and Alejandro will come up uh, to answer your questions. So any questions for Valentina? Yes, I have a question. I'm curious about like the time period like, for 2016 elements, or can one take as long as 2016, or is it like a temporary, or what is the time? We don't know the time, and that's why we're going to do uh, experiments. There are some literature, you know, but um, we have to, it depends on the algae, it depends on the sargassum, it depends also on the physical conditions. I imagine that will depend on pH, um, temperature, and different physical conditions. So it's something that, that we need to investigate. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Uh, Dwayne and uh, Alejandro. So there's only one minute, so we can be brief with the, the Q&A here. Uh, I, I'd you actually like guys to, are right in the shirt under the stick every time. I know. I'd, I'd <laughs> like to address uh, one of the previous questions. Uh, as far as moving that, that, that toxic situation from the beach to now out to the barrier, um, that only happens when the seaweed dies. The seaweed that's on the barrier out there isn't going to sit on the barrier if it's anchored properly. It, it's only when you have swales in between your anchors where it's not anchored properly that you have a pocket for it to sit in. If you have a nice dome shape or you have a nice straight line, that barrier is going to hit, the seaweed is going to hit that barrier like a rock wall and it's just going to keep moving. It's not going to sit on the barrier. So if installed properly, that doesn't happen. And the seaweed doesn't die out there. Um, it only dies when it comes into the beach. Great. Any uh, questions for Alejandro? Yes. So you want to repeat the question here for the webcast? Uh, I understand the question that it, you're asking, what is the process to, to manage? Uh, okay, that's, uh, they're asking what are the requirements to, uh, um, to start the process to maintain the beach. Well, that's, as I said before, it depends the kind of the beach that you have. Definitely, we need access to the beach. Um, we have permits right now in place for uh, um, Miami-Dade County, uh, for Broward County. Uh, our permits are, um, allow us to remove you know, any kind of debris, including the sargassum. Um, we have to study the storage of the equipment because we cannot leave the, the, the equipment on the beach. So it's a, it's a whole process to understand um, also the budget of the city or any other entity, uh, uh, the village or so on. So, but, but basically the requirement is to have access and to find a place to storage the, the, the equipment. We take care about the permits and, and so on. Thank you. Thank you guys. And again, as, as promised, there is never enough time for Q&A. Okay. So we need to uh, prepare ourselves a little bit here for the group discussions.
and this will be Valentina, Josefina, and I. We'll, we'll get ready. So how about we take a quick five-minute break from the discussions so we can get ourselves organized uh, to make sure we're most productive with our time. Thank you. Yo creo que debemos organizarnos ahora y no hablar con el grupo porque necesitamos prepararnos. ¿Me gustaría usar markers? ¿Qué dijo Sofía? No, está en con la televisión. Necesitamos los markers y vamos a poner cuatro de esos, uno, uno y uno y uno. Vamos a poner el sector, sector one, two, three, four. Okay. Government agencies, scientific community businesses, ¿verdad? Y esto, escribimos eso en la pizarra blanca arriba y escribes eh, what problems, issues are you facing. Entonces vamos a pedir que la gente aquí vaya a su sector y escriba los problemas. Yo creo que es mejor hablar, mejor vamos a hablar de eso, entre todos. No, no vamos a, o sea, yo creo que hay que decir, okay, ¿quién es el gobierno? O sea, háblenos del gobierno, ahorita nos va a tocar discutir qué es lo que están ustedes viviendo, el sector gobierno. Y vamos a hablar, no, no es que ni nada, hay que interactuar. Ya, ya, ya no, ya no hubo interacción. Vamos a hacer eso, entonces vamos a hacer cinco Pero minutos si quieren, por cada uno. No, 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 ya okay. no contemos. Sí, porque si no, vamos a pasar mucho el tiempo. Entonces, cinco minutos por cada sector. No dijimos que eran que diez. Sí, pero, pero ya estamos fuera de, de tiempo. Siete minutos. Porque si no, si no, ese sector nunca se va a correr. ¿eh? Queremos ser siete, siete y después de eso, si hay tiempo, regresamos. Sí, porque hay personas en la huerta también. Que un hogar, siete minutos cada uno. Entonces, regresamos. Y eso, con eso vamos a estar a tiempo. On the, on the webcast, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes.
Emilio, are you there? Yes, I am here. Somebody asked, uh, Joe, was that you? Yeah, that was me. Okay, great. So, so we're getting started now. Just one second. Over here, all the presenters, uh, please join me over here out front. And, uh, and the presenters are uh, joining out front. So we needed to uh, slightly change the format due to the really to the technical needs that we have here and to make sure that folks on the web that are joining us from all over the place can also uh, participate in the discussions as much as possible. So here's the, the approach that we're going with. We will have uh, seven minute blocks of time. And like we said in the beginning, this is a multi-sector issue. We need a multidisciplinary approach. There's lots of conversations here. There's not enough time and half a day to address everything. And we know that, um, but we got people together, right? So the reason we are limiting these discussions for seven minutes per sector is so that we can actually get to these sectors on time and cover your area of interest and where you may be able to help somebody, right? Because it is a collaborative effort. So uh, to start off, we will have the sector of government agencies. Now this says government agencies working on remediation efforts. Let's keep it a bit broader for government agencies. So we need to hear first, what are some of the issues that you're facing regarding sargassum? I know that we, we already mentioned a lot of them. And what will happen right after that, right after a, a government representative, so to speak, uh, provides some of the issues, then the group will talk about solutions, the presenters as well as members of the audience. And if you are uh, on the web, uh, please feel free to uh, use the chat feature to type in your, uh, your recommendations and solutions and also uh, to type in the issues that you're facing if you are part of that sector. And uh, for those on the web, just so you know, everybody in person can see the chat right now on the screen. So we will be able to uh, see all this information. So why don't we kick this off? Let me start off the timer. Could you, uh, the, the people that are working on government, could they raise their hand in order that we identify how many people from government we have here? Okay, so we have uh, like eight people, six people. So we want to know what are the problems that you're facing? So who, who want to start? And I'll repeat them. Every time I hear it, I'll repeat it for the folks on the web. Um, I mean, there's other types of local government. Um, anyone else wants to like let's try to get at least three questions and then later in between everybody we can address the, the uh, we can so for the folks on the web I will be using the chat feature uh, to uh, to type in these comments so I won't be repeating them. And obviously, I guess the common is the same issue as most government. How do you try to keep it off the beach or control it from the beach? Obviously, there's a cost involved in it. So we're really trying to find the most cost-effective way uh, to deal with the beach problems. We're a tourist-based economy, and people don't go to the beach. They don't come to the city. And so, but, but it's a constant battle. You can break the beach in the morning, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it looks like that beach hasn't been touched in weeks, and that's what we get. Yeah, guys, I haven't seen the beach in weeks, but we're trying to find a solution to, to uh, prevent that thing about, you know, sleeping in the morning, but the afternoon, we're back to the same boat that we were before. So one question from the people on the back. From... Okay, 
Joe, if you can uh, mute your microphone, I think I'm hearing you on this end. Yeah. having problems for the environmental impacts. So how does the scientists and the industry can address and help them to address this problem? Any scientists that want to talk? Or do, you, do we have to follow the time? Yeah, 
So raise your hand the ones that we can extend a little bit, like 20 minutes more. Everybody, okay. Okay, perfect. great. So, okay, so let's so say then instead of seven minutes per sector, we can ex ex extend it to, uh, we extend it to 15. We'll get here, we'll be out of here by 1230. So we're doubling our time uh, per sector, but we'll have uh, only an extra half hour for the whole. So 15 minutes, let's get it started now, Marcel. Okay. Now we're talking about the scientific community. What are some of the problems or issues you're facing? I mean, I just want to give us the, the comment they did for the short forming a group uh, that they from the different forming a group, uh, like the one for civil level rights. But for the sargassum, I, I just want to finish the comment. I want to know if the cities will have interest on that, and, and hopefully we can follow up with that. That's just the only comment I want to do. Right? Do you have, okay, the cities are answering yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Why don't we have all the presenters actually come up here so they can need to speak and get to be in front of the computer and uh, and everybody on the web can already hear you. So, so I think we, that um, following first, sorry, I don't know this, but I completely agree in terms of using the, and that's what I was saying, the algae are here to clean the mess, isn't it? But I think that we have to be very careful. We uh, And the private industry might have a different speed from science and from resources. And I think that we have to be really, really careful. Uh, there is no solution yet in the Caribbean. There is a lot of problems still with the barriers and with a lot of things and with the permits. And they are working with the hotels in marine protected areas and the impacts on the coral reefs need to be measured. And we are measuring them and we are measuring the amount of nutrients that is the signal in there. So I, I really would like to make a call to be following and we cannot sleep in our laurels and we cannot just be publishing the papers. I think we are getting a moment in that we need to do the science and work together with the private industry and work together in what are going to be the solutions that are not going to be sending the methane or any other kind of thing. So I, I really want to make a call that rushing up is not going to be the solution. So Peter, you want to talk about how the public can work with the government and can help the government? So I will I will type here what you're right. What are you saying? Unexpected, but I think basically what you said in your presentation is what we need to do because we're simply facing lack of information about the basic properties of sargassum, and it's quite clear that we have this Caribbean wide sargassum and ocean wide sargassum bloom, and but there also always was sargassum. There always was sargassum in the North Atlantic, and maybe the South Atlantic. So there's uh, a combination of both intrinsic and extrinsic controls uh, governing the, uh, this blue. And we sort of need to understand whether we can actually exert any influence on this by controlling our own mess, as opposed to the medicines which are downstream or upstream. So I think. Uh, and the first approach, we just need to understand whether there are any differences between these different masses of sargassum from the different areas. And uh, with that information, we can actually move uh, forward to the next phase, that is to see you know, whether this sargassum uh, originating in the south, in the equatorial Atlantic off Brazil, as it moves into the Caribbean, whether it actually maintains that composition or whether it continually regenerates itself or adapts, you know, as the algae uh, moves forward. We really don't know what the rates of growth are and how it actually changes as it moves and the life cycle. There's so many different questions that need to be addressed, not only geochemistry. I think geochemistry is a glaring, uh, sort of glaring absence of information. Here. So I think, uh, you know, when, and then, then the issues of how you deal with it, how you bury it. And uh, you know, this sargassum probably has a lot of sulfur. And therefore, when you bury it and it gets degraded, it produces a lot of unpleasant gases, uh, which um, not only contribute to the greenhouse gases, but also uh, smelling and so on. So there are lots of different aspects of this. And I think the, the, my, my, from my perspective, I think the geochemistry is uh, 
fundamental first step in understanding the function. Thank you. Just going to add something to that we haven't been discussing too much is the impact of the algorithm computation. So if you have something like high concentration of lead or potassium in your drug mass and you use area and you use a fertilizer, we need to understand the impact that has. So for me, for practical sense, we need to understand those those components of the drug mass and the whether I think that's something that I have seen in that is happening in the Caribbean uh, is that the local government is only thinking about to create immediate solutions and that is remediation. So they are not really considering to attack the cost because we don't understand the cost yet. So government in the Caribbean, they are not, and especially in Mexico where they are having a huge problem. So they are not, the, the government is not giving money uh, to the scientists in order that we help them to provide solutions. And this is something that we don't want that happen here. So we already learned the lessons from the Caribbean and we want to act different. So as a scientist, we, our role is try to understand processes and help the humanity. So that's why we need to provide the, 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 the questions to the government, but the government needs to, need to provide us also um, fundings in order that we can understand the problem. So there is a, a local problem and a global problem. The global, if we understand, there is some changes in the water chemistry that are occurring in the, in the equatorial, equatorial area, and only with oceanographic research cruises, interdisciplinary, uh, marine physics, marine chemistry, marine biology is the only way that we are going to investigate what are these, these, uh, these, these water quality, these water chemistry changes. What is causing the sargassum? We, we guess, okay, maybe they are nutrients, but who knows? Actually, with the isotope composition is something that we are going to get this data. But we need to have oceanographic cruises that maybe, you know, like this is a dream, but we need to organize governments because it's not only United States or the rich ones or the poor ones, you know, like the, uh, another islands that has to collaborate. We have governments need to collaborate to create a fund in order that we can go to the area, explore what is happening and not only one time, because this is something that is going to be occurring. You know, we need at least one year for cycle. And this is maybe short term because there are people working, you know, with great uh, scales and we are seeing changes, decal, decal changes, right? And actually um, here people from NOAA can tell us more what is happening. So we need to investigate those uh, th th in order to know the causes and in order to know if we can resolve it or if, how long are we going to dealing with that? Very short. One study that NOAA is currently uh, very interested in, and that is at the top of the list to go up to study the DNA of uh, water and life in the ocean. I believe that this could be a very good opportunity if you do a study of uh, DNA uh, of Sargassum. I'm sure that you will be probably able to identify. Yeah, so we need we need multidisciplinary research. So uh, Alicia is doing some DNA. So, but just to no, rest. I haven't done any DNA, but no? it's very important for me to show you that we need to be aware of what is happening already. So as you can see, the old now and not the old, the people from the people to the back. So this is one uh, by the March, and there is a reading and Henry Moran and they are doing some reflection on this one. So the useful way that our research is going on and our community is to recommend that they're doing a living research. So we have a lot of community that we need to train in the University of Alabama at the Public Affairs Center doing the analysis of one clone, one individual, what they are doing in the middle of us. Showing examples that they are doing. So for the folks on the webcast, I'm actually yeah. typing what, what I'm hearing in the room. So that is forensic taxonomy. So there is a lot of research going on. Already they, they are also measuring how many they lost and they are having more than people doing all of this. So what do we need? That's why in my talk, coordination and organization, what is the 
So we are not going to be the number one in the world. We are already more than over there. And of course, we can join those groups and, and not distract from the fact. And I think that is one of the core things for us to do. And I suggest you, if we're asking Captain John, is what is going on for you? What is the science that is going on? What are the concepts? So, you know, what are we meeting in October where we are already going to be announced? So um, the groups are being built up already. So Waterloo Committee, GCN5, is another place, and the Venus are where the scientists are already in process. And I think I have not mentioned all of them, but I'm pretty sure that no one's going to be feeling the intelligence. So the United Nations is giving a lot of input. All the Catalina conventions, the countries that already signed for Catalina convention, signed that one. But these people already within the United Nations have a small brand. We have the website. We have all of this information. So getting that is going to be quite difficult. Great, and and a lot of those resources we will be sharing on our website. Um, so if you got the little turtle. Uh, when you walked in, that has a QR code, and we will be updating that website, which is the same one they used to sign up for this event. We will be updating it with the uh, resources and links uh, for more information. So, does anybody want to speak about uh, solutions regarding these many uh, issues that were brought up by the scientific community? Helena, yes, please. If you can come over here, it would be easier so the folks uh, on the web can hear you. Um, in terms of solutions, I think um, in, on the remediation side, I know that there's a lot to be done on the scientific side to understand the processes, but I think ultimately we want to know what to do in certain situations. So um, when it comes to sewage, I, I think about sewage a lot. There is an ability for the environment to assimilate sources of contamination, but once you get beyond a certain point, you have to do something about it. So maybe at the beginning, um, you don't need septic tanks, but then once you get more populations, you need septic tanks. After that, you have to remove the sewage. So similar, I, I see it sim a similar aspect in terms of the sargasm, that I believe that there's a certain ability for the sand or um, the natural environment to assimilate the sargasm, but after a certain point, you, there's no way to accommodate it where you have to remove it. And I can envision different beaches have different characteristics in terms of bacteria. The high energy beaches tend to be cleaner beaches because they're constantly washed out. So maybe the high energy beaches can assimilate a little bit more sargasm, a little bit more of the integration versus a beach that's very quiescent and has very low wave, wave energy. And maybe some of these procedures or standard operating processes, um, we potentially through the science can come up with some general approaches to how to handle it. Are there other uh, solutions? to help address uh, some of the concerns that scientists have. We heard about funding, we heard about data that's missing, lacking. Any other stakeholder group that's being represented here that feels your type of stakeholder might be able to help? Uh, yeah, there is a uh, drawdown conference that's gonna be held between the 16th and the 18th of September. This is a group that is involved with carbon sequestration uh, as well as emissions uh, reduction. Uh, they are studying macroalgae, primarily the kelps in the Pacific, as ways of sequestering carbon. Uh, this might be an opportunity uh, to interact with those people uh, in drawdown as a possible solution uh, to, to global warming. So this is uh, connecting the dots uh, at the large scale. So any scientists that want to talk about the problems that they are facing and what do they need from the other sectors? Okay, Derek, uh, yes, if you can please come over here so the folks on the web can hear you. Uh, this is just sort of going off of what's, what we've been discussing, but I think one of the biggest things that we should try to keep in mind is that as we're talking about solutions or possible solutions and the research needed to, to come to those is that not everything is going to have the same solution. And I think we need to keep an open mind about that, that it may be a combination of many things that are going to be what is going to give us the best overall solution. One place is, is going to, you know, 
be able to use one solution, another place has something else. But I think we, we don't want to just try to find one, you know, fix all because we're never going to find one fix all for every place in every situation because it's, it's too dynamic. So I think, I think as we're talking about this, just try to keep an open mind about all of that, that it, it is going to be a, a multitude of things coming together that is going to be the ultimate way to, to hopefully benefit this. Great. Thank you. Okay, so now let's uh, reset the timer for 15 minutes so we can have the, the business. And, and a, a lot of these conversations are overlapping. So I don't want to miss that very important point. Uh, we are trying to bucket things, right, uh, into sectors here. Uh, but let's just be very clear that everything is overlapping. This is why you have uh, a government entity saying that they have an issue and then a scientist or a business coming up with a kind of a solution and vice versa, right? So let's, uh, let's start the timer now, 15 minutes, so that we can talk about uh, issues and problems that businesses that provide technologies and solutions for Sargassum are facing. So why don't we have, um, you know, Dwayne, uh, you can start, and then Alejandro, uh, talk about some of the problems that, that you're seeing or issues that you're seeing or sensing as a business that's trying to address this problem. And over here will be great for the webcast. Yeah, so again, my experience, so this is a relatively new problem. I know we've had seaweed, but it hasn't been in the volume that we've had this year. So it's, it's a relatively new problem, but we've been dealing with it at Alaska uh, since at least 2015, um, when we were first starting to get these calls about how bad it is in the Caribbean. Um, so what the resort owners struggle with is not only the cost, because they have to justify, are we really losing um, uh, customers coming to our resort based on the seaweed and you know we're, we're on TripAdvisor to you know when we're trying to you know approach uh, possible possible uh, sales for this we're we're doing all our canvassing on TripAdvisor that just all you have to do is search for the word seaweed and I'm sure that people that are taking vacations are doing the same thing is there seaweed on this beach at this resort and if so I'm going to choose another resort so um, the cost is something that, that business owners are probably going to struggle with um, to put a to put a barrier in the water. Not only the government aspect that we're working on to to, to be able to because it really what I'm hearing is let's keep it off the beach because as long as it's floating, it's not dying, um, and it's not smelling, um, and it's not causing an issue for swimming. So um, I think one of the solutions in the in the, in the package, you know, should be a floating barrier to either direct it somewhere where it's 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 you know, not causing a problem to the collector or it's away from turtles or what have you. Um, but these business owners, uh, you know, it's going to be a cost thing for them. Um, also the installation, uh, the installation probably needs to be done by a Marine contractor when we're in the Caribbean and dealing with this, um, you know, it's, it's a dentist bringing a boat around the, around the point, you know, and I'm working with some servers that they gave me, you know, from the hotel to put this in the water. So it's, um, you know, manpower to actually get it in the water and get it installed properly is something else that is also a, a struggle for business owners. So it really is all about the cost and can they, can they outweigh the cost of what they're losing in tourist dollars uh, to be able to, to offset the, the cost of a solution, whether it's beach cleaning or, or barriers. So, so, so Dwayne, I guess another way, maybe I didn't phrase it right. Like oh. what, what makes it difficult for you to be able to provide a solution? What makes it difficult for Elastic to be able to provide a solution effectively? Like what are some challenges for you? Yeah, the, the only challenge is, uh, uh, there's a few. Um, uh, having a boat opening in a barrier, because that's what we're talking about with Elastic is, is putting barriers in the water to keep the seaweed out, but you have vessel traffic. You have snorkeling boats that need to go out to the snorkeling reef, and, and how do you work with that? And, and you know, we've, we've got some experience in overlapping barriers. Um, putting gates in barriers does not work, so that's one thing. Um, uh, where to put the barrier. Uh, I mentioned breaking waves. You don't want to have the barrier in breaking waves. There's no floating barrier that's going to survive breaking waves. Hurricanes, you got to pull it out of the water. It's not going to survive a hurricane. Um, so there's, there's water conditions and we do load modeling. So if you call and give me the wind conditions, the wave conditions and the flow rate of the current, we can tell you how often you need to anchor it. Is every 25 foot adequate? Does it need to be more? What's the barrier going to do in the water? How's it going to react? How's it going to billow in the flow? Uh, so we can provide all that data. So that's something that, you know, is also a, a challenge is where to place it. So if you don't have that data, then it actually makes it difficult to make these decisions. Oh, it does. Yeah. We, we always ask for that information and, and anyone who's looking to put a barrier in the water, where are you looking to put it? Um, why are you looking to put it here? Uh, what are the features on the shore that you need to anchor to? Um, what okay. is the change in tide? 
Um, so that, you know, we, we address all those issues before we say whether a battery can work because it doesn't work in all situations. Good, good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Alejandro, uh, for your type of uh, company, uh, let's say a, a generic company, let, let's say company X that is trying to provide a service to remove sargassum either from the sand or from the waterways. What are some challenges that they're having? Like industry wide, what are some problems that the industry is facing that makes it hard for you to accomplish your job? Um, I have actually m many uh, issues uh, basically with government. Um, uh, I would mention probably like three, the main ones uh, is budget. Um, most of the times governments don't have the budget because they never thought about this. Um, another issue is lack of knowledge. Um, I have experience fighting kind of a big fight actually with different governments uh, challenging me and telling me that I didn't have the permit to remove the sargassum when in fact I was even showing the permit from the state of Florida. Um, and I think that is another big problem and, and I believe that is, is not only for for a company like, like the one that I represent in terms of business wise, but uh, the fact that it's something kind of like seasonal. Um, so sometimes there are tourists, uh, uh, governments that they are very worried right now because they have a lot of sargassum, tourists are not coming, beach girls are upset and blah, blah, blah. But uh, this is, you know, the amount of sargassum is going to go a little bit lower in a couple of months probably. And, and governments forget about this. And they don't realize that it's coming back again. Um, so they, again, it's like a circle. Uh, <clears throat> they don't realize that it's coming back, so they don't budget for the next year. And like Carlos was mentioned to me before, and it's, it's something that occurs all, all the time. And um, you can clean it today, but you don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. So there are, you know, government basically that sometimes they say it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money because tomorrow is going to be the same thing. I keep telling everybody that we have to keep the beach clean on a regular basis and maintain the beach. This is, uh, uh, as many municipalities can probably say, is basically the, the only asset for many municipalities in South, in South Florida. Um, tourists is, is the industry. Um, and, and the same way that <clears throat> I keep telling everybody, the same way that you keep clean your pool and, and, and do the landscaping for the hotel, for the resort, for the, for the, for the municipality, you have to clean your beach. You have to make sure that is, is being maintained because it's not only something aesthetic, but the, the word saying before about the bacteria problem, that is a big, big issue. And an ambition that at some point, someone is going to start creating a lot of trouble and a lot of problem, uh, making a lot of questions, and, and it's going to become probably a, a legal issue. Thank you, thank you. So, so you just heard from a couple of uh, companies that are trying to provide solutions, but they have challenges, right? In their, their interaction with their clients, which may be government agencies, um, timeline issues. Okay, we're talking about uh, somebody thinking that a seasonal issue is a temporary issue, when in fact it may be a, a long-term issue, but has a, a seasonal need, right? In terms of uh, when you implement or do something. So we have about seven minutes um, for the audience here, like what are some solutions that you can think of to address these issues that the businesses are facing? Yes, I, I think uh, I, I started with the uh, Thank you. So for the folks on the web, the, one of the recommendations was to collaborate with scientists to address the root of the problem. I have two solutions. Stop dumping the greenhouse gases into our atmosphere and stop dumping nutrients into our ocean. How fast <laughs> So two solutions mentioned, uh, stop dumping uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gases and nutrients the into the atmosphere and nutrients into the ocean. Okay. Um, I 